Good afternoon. Wow, nice. I like that. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the University of Minnesota Law School. I am Gary Jenkins, the Dean, and it is my privilege to welcome you all to uh, today's conference. We are thrilled that you are here for on all fronts, defending the borders of the United States Constitution. This is the inaugural annual forum convened by the James H. Binger Center for New Americans. This forum also serves as an opportunity, though, for us to highlight the uh, uh, permanency, if you will, of the Binger Center. Um, because this is the first large conference of the center since we received a transformational $24.5 million gift from the Rabina Foundation to endow and rename the center nine months ago. This gift is the largest in the history of the law school and also, we believe, the largest gift in clinical legal education anywhere. And it's through the power of this philanthropy paired with this law school that we're able to convene together today, uh, bringing together distinguished voices on some of the most important legal and moral issues currently facing our country, uh, bringing together community stakeholders and students to advance the ideas and strategies and policies related to immigration and asylum issues. So I'm really excited. I hope that you're excited for the program that we have today. The Binger Center provides comprehensive legal services for immigrant communities through our three integrated legal service clinics. The Federal Immigration Clinic, the Detainee Rights Clinic, and the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic. The center is also home to a very active education and outreach program, which educates non-citizens on their legal rights and provides uh, training to local lawyers so that they can provide pro bono legal services to immigrant clients. And later today, we're going to share a video that highlights the center and its work. But the success of the Binger Center is due in part uh, to its innovative partnership model, in which the law school has forged relationships with three pro bono programs at three prominent law firms uh, here in the Twin Cities, as well as relationships with three of our state's leading uh, immigration nonprofit service providers. And this model is only uh, the only one of its kind around the country, and it enables the center to expand the depth and the breadth of its impact. And I would like to recognize and thank Dorsey and Whitney, Fagri Baker Daniels, and Robbins Kaplan, the Advocates for Human Rights, Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, and Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid for their partnership. Now, since uh, its inception four years ago, the center has served more than 800 detainees, educated more than 2,000 immigrants about their rights, and trained more than 900 lawyers and community members on how to effectively provide needed services to immigrant clients. The center has also successfully litigated cases before the Board of Immigration Appeals, multiple federal circuit courts, and up to the United States Supreme Court challenging, changing laws, policies that have impact thousands and millions. But there is still so much more to be done. In 2015, there were just over one million immigrants who were granted permanent lawful residence in the United States. By contrast, there were an estimated 11 million immigrants residing in the United States without lawful status two-thirds of whom had been living in the country for over a decade. Of the 65,000 
asylum petitions filed in 2016, only 13% were granted. The critical need for accessible legal services for our immigrant and refugee communities has only intensified in the last year as the world around us has changed. We know that orders of removal are up. We know that another Supreme Court showdown appears imminent uh, over the President's third attempt at instituting a travel ban. And there's no indication that these activities will decrease in the foreseeable future. But beyond the noteworthy executive orders and headline-grabbing court cases, there's the equally important issue of how the immigrant population is perceived, not only here in Minneapolis, but also in cities and towns across America. Are the new immigration restrictions driven by anti-immigrant sentiment and Islamophobia, as some claim? Or are they unconnected, as proponents claim, to racial and religious animus, but instead focused on safeguarding national security? Either way, it's undeniable that our country's heightened attention to the status of our immigrant population has had a multitude of effects, from how our country is viewed on the world stage to how Americans view immigration and those who are impacted by it, to how the new migrants view their own place in America. And I think it's fitting that the University of Minnesota is hosting this forum, which combines a presentation on the major trends and developments in immigration law with a discussion on the impacts of, uh, uh, that such laws have on our immigrant communities. The James H. Binger Center for New Americans was developed as a comprehensive initiative to transform the lives of our nation's immigrant and refugee communities. And that's what these conversations uh, do. That's what the kind of study and analysis and hard thinking that we do here contributes to. So I want to, once again, thank the Rabina Foundation its founder, Jim Binger, uh, class of 41, uh, the Binger family, the leadership of the Rubina Foundation, the chair of the board, Kathleen Blatz, and its executive director, Penny Hunt, who are here with us today. Thank you uh, for your generosity and your vision. And we are a better institution because of it. And I also want to thank Professor Ben Casper Sanchez, the Executive Director of the Binger Center, uh, Depender Mayal, the Director of uh, Education and Outreach, for their tireless work in putting this uh, spectacular forum together, our, our entire faculty and staff uh, at the Binger Center who work, every, who work extraordinarily hard every day to make a difference. Uh, in this community. Now, I fully understand that my role is simply to warm up the crowd, uh, to get people settled, uh, to maybe set the stage a little bit for the conference, um, but I don't want to stand in the way anymore of the great dialogue that we've got planned uh, for you. So I want to, again, just say thank you to our distinguished speakers for their contributions and for all of you for your participation and engagement for the day. And now I'm going to hand things over over to Depender Mayall so that we can begin the important work of the day. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dean Jenkins. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, before we start, we have some three, three excellent sessions today, but um, we wanted to show you a little bit more about the center and its impact. Every six months, I would go in and check in with the uh, ICE officer at immigration. And usually the procedure is pretty simple. I go in there with my card, sheet of paper that I've been carrying for years, and they sign off. They're like, okay, thank you for checking in. Where are you working? Where do you live? You know, it's like, it's the same story. I live in the same address. I work for the same people. I'm 
my gut, I knew it wasn't good. But everybody that I spoke to, you know, kind of <clears throat> reassured me. It's like, Chad, you're doing so well. You know, it's like you've been participating in the community, you've been volunteering at the churches, and you know, it's like you're doing so well. My parents are originally from Cambodia, and they fled Cambodia to Thailand. We're, we're both in tears, you know, it's like we didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know that my wife's gonna like put on her cape and save the world. <laughs> but <laughs> all of them like worked together to get me back to my to my wife, and to my children, and to to my life here. And you know, I was like, I don't know what I've done. I was like, I feel like I own the world. Binger Center for New Americans is a proud achievement for and by the students of the University of Minnesota Law School. Our students have been able to represent detained refugees, launch community education programs that benefit thousands of immigrants, and so much more than this, all thanks to our partners. By creating the Binger Center for New Americans, they've created three immigration clinics as well as a dedicated education and outreach program, which is a robust immigration clinical experience for law students coming through this school. On top of that, our partnerships with our nonprofit partners allow us to fully understand what the needs are in the community. With the help of the Center for New Americans, I designed a project to do outreach to immigrants in rural areas of the state through medical clinics called Medical Legal Partnership. When we do this work, we do it in collaboration. Our partnerships with our large law firms bring expertise and resources, but it gives students the opportunity to work creatively to take on some major immigration problems. I knew what a great experience the Detainee Rights Clinic was for me and the strong sense of justice and passion I felt for working on these cases. I wanted to keep it going. I reached out to our uh, attorney who is the liaison for the Center for New Americans and expressed my interest in getting involved and they embraced that with open arms. They're working directly on cases for asylum seekers fleeing uh, violence and persecution from around the world. And they are working directly on Supreme Court arguments. The students who come here get um, their hands on some very exciting work. You get your hands dirty. You get in there. You get to, you know, do everything. You learn fact collecting, how to do requests, how to do client interviews and interactions, you know, how to go to court. While we were flying there, there were a number of immigration raids that happened in Atlanta. During those five days, it was people like literally running across a trailer to like get papers scanned in and then sent to someone in Washington, D.C. to file with the Board of Immigration Appeals. It's very, very rare for lawyers to actually be running or for there to be literally that much urgency. I mean, really just an incredible experience that really um, solidified for me um, a passion to continue in immigration law. If we were to sum up the Binger Center in one word, it would be impact. Impact on immigration law and policy, impact on our students who are working in the clinic, and an impact on the immigrants who are served by the center. The Binger Center has an enormous impact on the lives of so many people. Thank you, everyone. We are very pleased to have you with us today for this uh, forum on all fronts defending the borders of the U.S. Constitution. Um, we are going to um, be covering some, some different perspectives of the issues that are going on around the country today. Um, our first session will be covering some of the issues uh, dealing with federal litigation, particularly the travel ban. Um, we'll also be hearing about um, uh, immigrant communities and, and what is happening um, for some of the racial realities across the country, as well as a perspective um, about 
um, deportees um, and really what happens to people um, and the struggles that they are going through, the real faces um, and stories of individuals who are going through, through this. A uh, quick note on logistics, um, like I said, there'll be three sessions. There'll be 15 minute breaks between the sessions. Um, so, um, so you know if you need to take some time. Um, you'll find in front of you, um, there are um, copies of the program as well as copies of our annual report. So if you'd like to learn more about us and some of the work we do, um, please take a look at that. Um, I urge you to, um, to look more into the center. Our first presenter today is Omar Jadwat, who is the director of the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project. Um, Omar will present and will be joined on stage by uh, Professor Benjamin Sanchez Caspers, Casper, Benjamin Sanchez Casper. <laughs> ben. Sorry, the executive director of the Binger Center for New Americans. <laughs> Do you think I would know that? Yeah. That'll be, uh, yeah. So you'll see there's cards in front of you. Um, the, the, the presentation uh, will be led by a discussion between Ben and Omar. Um, if you have questions, fill out the cards, um, pass them around. We will curate um, those questions and then pass them up for discussion. Um, Omar is lead counsel um, in International Refugee Assistance Project versus Trump. Um, known to many as one of the travel ban cases. Um, and <clears throat> what I don't want to do is overstate the role of this one set of litigation in the ACLU and Omar's leadership and prominence in the field of federal litigation, particularly to defend immigrants' rights and oppose discriminatory laws. This fight has been going on for some time, and Omar has been a leader in this fight in federal courts and the Supreme Court for years. And I think that is a common theme that you're going to hear today, that while the current issues seem drastic and serious, um, they have been building for quite some time now. At the same time, um, I do not want to understate in any ways how, for failure of a better word, how ridiculous this year's, um, this litigation has been. Um, it has been up and down, um, and all, all seriousness. Um, very complex, very challenging. Um, it changes by, can change by the week, can change by the tweet. Um, in, in reality, this case was supposed to be done. I mean, Omar was supposed to give oral arguments at the Supreme Court about two weeks ago, um, and uh, now those cases have been dismissed, and we're back at the uh, circuit court level. Um, so, um, you know, certainly this is one of the most watched and most followed series of court challenges in the last decade. Um, it was the opening salvo in what many feel is an outright onslaught on immigrant rights. Um, but maybe more importantly, I think the cases brought by the ACLU, the early injunctions, the responses of outraged people and the actions at the airports, um, they set a tone, a tone of objection, a tone of resistance, and a tone of hope. Um, and I think that tone has resonated in our communities, not just in the immigrant rights movement, but in so many movements for justice we see growing right now. So I wanna say thank you to Omar in the midst of all this, uh, in the midst of um, this litigation for joining us here today. Um, I know that's uh, a lot to ask and we are very appreciative. Thank you to the ACLU national office and the local office who have been partners with the CNA on some of the first cases we have brought here. Um, and with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Omar Jadwan. It was an inspiring backdrop, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to, um, to visit with you here uh, at the Binger Center. And, um, you know, I just think it's such an, an interesting and important model um, for uh, both for law school education and for community impact. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know that we uh, both nationally and at the ACLU of Minnesota have already been working with the center, um, but I just want to add 
my voice of um, appreciation and excitement about uh, what you all are doing here. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, we're, uh, what, nine months into the Trump administration now. And um, one thing that's clear about this administration is that it is waging a brutal and public war on immigrants. Um, since January, just to name a few examples, um, the Trump administration has terminated the DACA program, which protected 700,000 young immigrant dreamers who came to this country as children uh, from deportation and allowed them to work legally. It's threatened judges, mayors, police and sheriffs who refuse to make the courts, police and jails extensions of the federal immigration enforcement system. It's trampled on due process in a rush to detain and deport uh, people who have been living here peacefully for many, many years um, and face persecution if they are deported. It's drastically shrunk and hamstrung our country's refugee resettlement system. And it's doubled down on pre-existing severe detention policies under which immigrants who, pour, uh, who pose no danger or risk of flight are held in jail indefinitely, sometimes for years, without even getting a chance to explain why they shouldn't be detained. And the administration has said in no uncertain terms that every undocumented person in the United States is at risk of arrest and deportation. And as you saw in that video, uh, and as we're seeing every day, they really mean it. Unshackled ICE and Border Patrol agents have acted with immeasurable cruelty uh, under this administration. You may have heard, for example, about the case of Rosa Maria, a 10-year-old girl with cerebral palsy who's lived in Laredo, Texas since she was three months old. <clears throat> uh, she was last week on her way to a medical appointment when her uh, transport vehicle was stopped at a Border Patrol checkpoint. Border Patrol officers demanded her papers uh, and those of her U.S. citizen cousin who was traveling with her. She didn't have any papers as a 10-year-old. Um, they held her at the checkpoint, except for papers from the hospital explaining uh, why she needed to travel there and that she had the permission of her parents to be with her cousin. They held her at the checkpoint for half an hour and then they followed her car to the hospital. They shadowed her every move at the hospital. Two seats away from her in the, in the waiting room. Uh, they didn't allow the door to her exam room to be closed so that they could keep an eye on her. <clears throat> they set up outside her recovery room overnight. And then <clears throat> as soon as she was formally discharged from the hospital, directly from her hospital bed, arrested her. <clears throat> and instead of letting her go home to her parents, um, put her in a shelter for unaccompanied kids hundreds of miles from her home. Um, where she is currently recovering from her surgery with no family, no therapy for her disability, um, and very little support. So the first question in my mind when I hear this story, and I think probably most people's, is you know, how can the government do that to this child? And that's an important question. But there are a lot of other questions, too. How can the government threaten any child who's lived her entire life in the United States with deportation? How can the government arrest anyone on civil immigration charges in a hospital without even obtaining a warrant or demonstrating that there's any emergency? How can the government pursue a policy that says everyone, everyone is a priority for deportation? So even as we're pursuing emergency litigation to get Rosa Maria home to her parents as quickly as possible, we'll also be working to raise these broader questions. And our goal is to get to a place where the answers are that they can't. They can't do this sort of thing to anybody. Um, 
All right, so I'm supposed to be talking about the Muslim ban. Um, I'm about to get there, but I, I, I did want to kind of frame things up a little bit because to us, uh, as Dupender said, I mean, this, the, the Muslim ban litigation is part of a facet of, um, of an immigration policy that tramples in many ways on our most fundamental values uh, as a nation. And so, you know, let's take us back uh, to before the election. Uh, when he was a candidate, President Trump said, Islam hates us. He said, we have a problem with Muslims and we have a problem with Muslims coming to this country. He called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. And then he explained that he would implement that ban by talking territory instead of Muslim. These statements themselves are shocking and, at least in the modern era, unprecedented. And in the Establishment Clause, the Free Exercise Clause, and the Equal Protection Clause of our Constitution, there's a requirement that the government be neutral with respect to religions. And the Constitution prohibits the government from denigrating a particular religion or its adherents. But the shocking statements were statements. What happened a week after President Tr Trump took office was that he translated them into action. And I just want to tell you a little bit about you know, what those first days under the ban looked like uh, from, from my perspective and the perspective of some of the other lawyers who, who were working on this litigation. So over that first week of the Trump administration, we had heard a lot of rumors that, in fact, uh, the president was going to follow through on those threats, that he was actually going to implement some kind of Muslim ban. There had been some drafts leaked. Um, it was, frankly, a little hard to believe that those drafts were going to get signed. Um, but we took it seriously, and, and we had been planning for months for the possibility that some of these campaign uh, promises would come true. So we you know, convened our little group. Um, we were talking through litigation strategy, doing memos, you know, all that stuff. And then on, on that Friday, on the 27th, um, which was Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, you know, we had heard that today, that was going to be the day, right? And, and, and the news broke sometime in the afternoon that, in fact, he had signed um, some sort of ban order. But the actual order took hours uh, to come out. And uh, so as a result, I spent a lot of time that day on Twitter, you know, because that's how you find things out, right? <laughs> um, and and um, so, you know, I'm scrolling, reloading. And, and throughout that day, um, because it was Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, there were tweets going out from a feed uh, that someone had set up that the names and the images of refugees uh, who had been turned away from the United States on the St. Louis um, before, uh, before the Holocaust and, and uh, ended up per perishing in the camps. And so that's, you know, what we're seeing as we're waiting to see what this order actually says, right? And then finally that evening, we had the order in hand and, you know, uh, it explicitly banned refugees, all refugees, for 120 days. Um, banned uh, a very heavily, predominantly Muslim group of people uh, from any kind of uh, legal immigration for, for 90 days. And, uh, you know, we looked it over, we compared it to what we thought would have been coming. And we made a plan to get the papers drafted and to get into court quickly. You know, we thought, 10 days, you know, we could get everything together, go in, try to get a PI. And then as soon as I hung up that phone call, um, we started getting emails and texts and more phone calls. And, and we found that they were already implementing this ban, that literally people who had sold all their possessions, uh, packed up their lives 
gotten on planes to come to the United States because they had finally gotten these visas. Uh, they were getting detained when they landed, held at the airports and being told that they were going to be put on return flights uh, to their countries of origin. Lawful permanent residents who'd lived, there, lived here for decades might have been off on a brief trip to visit family, to do business, whatever, were getting told the same thing. And so as these calls were coming in and the texts and the emails, uh, we reconvened that group. We actually convened a little bit of a bigger group. And so it was colleagues at the International Refugee Assistance Project who actually had clients in this situation, um, the National Immigration Law Center, and a clinic at Yale Law School. And so it was probably 10 at night, um, Eastern time. We actually had folks all across the time zones <laughs> on, on these calls, but um, that we were, we were sitting down and, and really trying to make a plan. And, and so that night, we worked through the night um, to try to put together some kind of action that might be able to put things on hold for at least the two IRAP clients who were, who were um, being held at the airport. And then as, you know, as information was coming in from other places, we realized we actually had to try to take our best shot at halting everything nationwide. Um, and even as we were working on those legal papers, right, and this is where, um, you know, I think uh, it's very similar to the, some of the work uh, that the center does here, the, the, these habeas petitions um, for folks who are uh, in immigration custody. Um, our experience and the experience of our partners in being able to put these together very quickly, um, you know, was important. And so even while we're kind of repurposing stuff we've done in the past and building on new stuff and trying to get those papers together, um, we realized it was also important to get the word out. And so part of my job that night, uh, as it turned out, was um, uh, trying to get uh, some media to understand what was happening to people um, uh, at the airports. And so I managed to reach a, a New York Times reporter like 12.30 at night, um, got him out of bed, maybe pulled a little bit of bait and switch, told him it was an easier story than it turned out to be. Um, <laughs> Not on purpose, but, uh, but it, it worked out. Um, and, and we spent hours, actually, uh, you know, trying to explain. I spent hours that night trying to explain to him what, the, what was actually going on. He got his colleague out of bed even later at night, maybe at 2 or 3 in the morning, uh, in Houston to go and interview the wife of one of our clients who was waiting to, uh, for her husband to come join her. Um, they went out with a photographer. And so the result was that, you know, at f by 8 o'clock the next morning, we had a habeas petition on file. We had a motion for class certification on file. Um, and we had a story in the New York Times that explained what was happening uh, and who it was happening to. And, sorry. And, um, you know, at the same time, we, <laughs> we don't have a very good idea of what's happening, right? Over the course of that night, um, and, and part of the reason was that the government, right, didn't know what was happening. There, there was no consultation with uh, any actual agency officials before they rolled out this ban. Um, and uh, in fact, as we later found out, they actively prevented the Department of Justice, the, the, the acting attorney general, and other high-ranking people at the Department of Justice from finding out what they were doing. So they rolled it out. There was written, presumably, by Stephen Miller or somebody who doesn't really know uh, immigration law. And, um, and there were a lot of open questions, and the, the folks at the airports didn't know what to do. And so what, what we were finding was that, you know, what we were hearing in little snippets, right, from, from occasionally one of our clients would be able to make a phone call. Occasionally we would hear from somebody who had been through secondary inspection what they had seen inside, you know, 
Occasionally, we'd get an answer from, from the CBP officials at the airport. Um, but it was, it, was a, it, it was a situation that changed minute by minute. We were told initially, well, you know, this terminal closes at, I think it was midnight or maybe it was 2 or 3 in the morning. And if we don't have something authorizing us to keep these guys here, um, when the terminal closes, they're going to be sent back. Um, and then we heard that, no, well, okay, we think we can move them to another terminal um, and await, you know, some kind of information from, from D.C. in the morning about what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, you know, of course, nobody was empowered to actually let these people go um, and, 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 you know, give legal effect to the visas that they, that they actually had. Um, Anyway, come the morning, we had our papers on file. There was this, you know, story in the paper, um, and um, and and our community group partners had been putting out the word to their networks, right? So, I think at uh, at noon at JFK, there were maybe a couple dozen folks there uh, who mostly were people who, you know actually were trying to find a particular person that they had a pre-existing relationship with. Um, now, over the course of that afternoon at JFK, thousands of people showed up. And that happened all around the country. Uh, I think maybe even at some airports that don't get international flights. But um, <laughs> there were, there were uh, people turning out you know, um, all around the country, coming out to uh, to help in whatever way they could, right? And to demonstrate their support. And to show that this uh, was not who we were as a nation. And so later that night, Saturday, this is still you know less than 30 hours after the ban was, was signed, uh, we were in court in Brooklyn uh, tr asking for a nationwide stay of removals. And um, and while we're in court, fortunately, it was one of those, one of the courtrooms where you can use your cell phones, or at least it was that night. Um, and uh, and we got a call during the hearing from the airport saying, you know, they're they're still putting people on planes. There's a woman on a plane right now, um, who is going to get sent back. And you know, we kind of like interrupted ourselves or the government or whoever, and told the judge, listen, this is what we're hearing. Um, and she stopped the hearing and issued the order. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, um, it was an amazing moment. It was an amazing thing to see. Uh, uh, to, you know, I, I stayed behind in the courtroom and I took photos of the, of the order and put them out on Twitter and I was hearing that, you know, uh, Folks contacted me the next day and said, "Oh, you know, I was showing people, <laughs> I was showing the CVP port director uh, your Twitter feed. Uh, <laughs> that was that was the way that um, some people, you know, got this thing across. Um, but it was it was a, um, you know, and there was a when we walked out of the courthouse, there was a brass band. <laughs> there were, it was, you know, like a a really unusual experience." Um, uh, you know, part of that was was the the um, but we were we were in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was also that people knew what had happened. That that um, that a week into the administration, um, that people had shown right had shown Donald Trump that um, that people can fight back right and 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 not just you know and that in fact you know even if you start with immigrants and even if you start with Muslim immigrants. Uh, <clears throat> that people are going to stand up. And, um, you know, over the next few weeks, there were a flood of cases all around the country uh, challenging the ban in various ways. Uh, the state of Washington got the first comprehensive um, injunction. Our, our, that stay that we got the first night was just on people actually being removed subsequent, um, pursuant to the ban. Uh, the state of Washington got a uh, a, a PI putting the whole ban on hold. Um, the government eventually gave up 
on that first ban decided to replace it with something that they thought would stand up better in court. Uh, and then there was a whole new round of emergency litigation again um, against that second ban. Uh, in March, on the cusp of that second ban going into effect, we got uh, uh, the ACLU and our partners won one of the two orders that blocked version two of the Muslim ban. Uh, that was in the IRAP case. And we successfully defended that win in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the state of Hawaii got a similar injunction in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and the government took both cases up to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court, as an interim matter, let uh, a narrow um, part of the ban go into effect with respect to people who had pre-existing, uh, for people who didn't have relationships with individuals or entities in the United States. Then there was a whole nother round of litigation about what that meant. Um, and the upshot of it all was that the court was going to hear argument last month on whether the ban was lawful, whether it violated the Establishment Clause, whether it was statutorily, uh, whether it exceeded the, the government's statutory authority. Um, but then the government issued the third version of the ban. Uh, and the third verse of this song sounds a lot like the second one. Um, we're back. We got another injunction from the District of Maryland. Hawaii got another injunction from the District of Hawaii. Uh, both cases are now up in the Courts of Appeals. We're going to have oral arguments in December. Um, and the government, uh, obviously, uh, if we continue to prevail, is going to try to take uh, the cases up to the Supreme Court. Um, so you know, there's a lot of chapters still to be written, or at least a few chapters still to be written in this um, Muslim ban litigation. But I think there are some lessons uh, that we can learn already. Uh, from, from what's happened. And I think the first is that, uh, you know, just, just that uh, the litigation does have real on the ground value uh, for the people uh, who were subject to this ban. Uh, for nine months now, the, the ban has been either partially or completely on hold. Um, and, e and just as important, uh, the president in each iteration of the ban has had to scale it back to some degree, um, you know, maybe increase it in other, in other senses. But without um, there being this ongoing litigation, it seems clear to me, and I think to, uh, to most people who've been following it, that we would have had a much further expanded by, ban by this point, right? So we've had, um, you know, thousands of people have been able to immigrate lawfully to the United States to visit here uh, who otherwise might not have. Families have been reunited rather than separated. That's really important. Um, and I think equally importantly, um, it sent an early message to this administration that both the courts and the public, each in their own ways and you know, in some ways uh, that are related to each other, that the courts and the public are real constraints on this agenda. And even despite the parade of horribles that I laid out at the beginning here, um, if we had not had an early affirmation of those principles, that there are constraints, that there's, um, there are, there, there are, that there's ways that people and the courts can stand in the way, um, I think we'd be in an exponentially more difficult situation today. And then, you know, I think the other lesson, or at least one other lesson, is that while the courts and the Constitution can constrain this administration, the administration's always going to try to wriggle out of those constraints. Um, and so all of these fights are going to be long, they're going to be hard, they're going to be intense. And for them to be of truly lasting value, we have to think about how to use them to create both a legal landscape and a public understanding of the issues that would allow us one day, not just to return to where things were before Trump, um, but to actually have a fairer, more just immigration system. Um, and it's not an easy fight, but I hope we're all going to do it together. Thanks.
for being here. Um, you know, I'll just monologue briefly here um, to pile on the thanks um, to the Rubina Foundation, um, to our partners. I think we've got representatives from almost all our partner organizations here. Um, to our students and to our clients, um, it's just a, it's just a wonderful time to be here. And 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 ACLU is it certainly has been one of our most important allies, um, both nationally and locally. Nationally, um, the very first case I had a student work on, uh, I wandered in here like within a few weeks. I, I needed students. I didn't have any students. We didn't have a clinic. So uh, Julia Decker, I think, is in the office. Yeah, there's Julia. Uh, I, I assigned her uh, an Eighth Circuit petition for a hearing on a, on a metaphysical jurisdictional question about uh, review of, of the one-year asylum filing bar. Um, looking back, it was just it was persecution in its, in its own right. <laughs> but it would have been much worse if it hadn't been for legal or two who, who came in and, and, um, and, and, and offered us an amicus brief and, and a lot of counseling to, to, to all of us and to, to Julie especially. Um, and then locally too. Um, every important piece of litigation we've done here has been in consultation or co-counseling with ACLU and our partners. Our first habeas case was uh, was an operation with, with Ian Bradley and, and Teresa Nelson and uh, John Gordon, who's just, just been, I don't know if any of them are here, but, but our new state director, they've been ab absolutely essential allies to us, and so we thank them. Um, I, guess, I, I guess the first thing I'd like you to talk about, since we are a clinical program, um, how did that affect you? You come from NYU, right? Yeah. Do you, and there were clinics involved in, in, in this first round of, of, of litigation. I think they did, you know, with Mike, Mike's clinic at Yale, quite, uh, quite crucial work. But both with re respect to the travel ban and, and more, more generally, how do you see uh, clinics playing, playing a role in, in the formation of immigration policy or improving it? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the I, I think particularly in, in immigrants' rights or immigration law more generally, um, the, the clinics across, you know, across the whole academy are super important. Um, they're, 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 uh, they're super important not just, um, you know, for the work they do, but for creating a, a cadre. I mean, I look at my, uh, my colleagues, my, now they're my colleagues, they, my classmates from uh, the clinic I did at NYU, uh, the Immigrant Rights Clinic at NYU, uh, I was in the class of 2001, um, and so many of my classmates uh, from that clinic or clinic mates uh, are still, um, you know, doing immigrants' rights work and are leaders in this field uh, uh, today. And that's, you know, I think a lot of you know people from from the from a lot of clinics can say the same thing about how um, how important they are and how important they've been in really creating that infrastructure, right? And that's why, you know, um, that that first night uh, with the Muslim ban, it was um, <laughs> virtually everybody uh, uh, eh. A lot of people working on that case that night were former students of, of Mike Wishney's uh, at one place or another, um, including current students for, or, yeah, at, at the clinic. And, um, and you know, uh, that, that we could plug in however many it was. It might have been 20 people. Like, it was a lot of people from the clinic who were working overnight uh, on, on making that happen. It's just been incredible. And, you know, just, I mean, the ordinary, our, our students over the summer, um, did a lot of work. I mean, they were there every week, every weekend, and late almost every night. And this is not sounding great to you guys. No, no, like, that's exactly you know, what it should be. But but they told us that they really liked it, you know, um, because because <laughs> they're smart, right? Um, no, but I, I mean, I think it was very you know exciting, and and they were crucial to making this work. Well, great. That's thanks. And I just want to reiterate: we are taking questions, I believe, from cards. So do bring them on down. So you don't have to hear the product of my mind too much. Um, I guess I, taking that another step up, I mean, so we have law school clinics, but what about universities 
writ large, and especially public universities, um, do you want to talk about their role in, in the litigation? Um, you know, when I look at the, the pleadings, it does strike me that, that uh, a lot of the force of the pleadings came from, from public universities, especially the Washington and Hawaii um, records as those were developed. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the state challenges uh, to the Muslim ban are the state standing in large part has turned on the idea that the states are basically like uh, have a proprietary interest in, in their universities and that their universities are being affected by the fact that people can't come and study there, you know, can't do uh, academic exchanges, that very, in various ways the, the daily life of the university is disrupted um, by, uh, by the ban. And so it's been, it's been, they've been critically, you know, they, they've been the key, I think, to the arguments the states have been making about why they should uh, be able to bring these cases. And obviously, the Washington and Hawaii cases have been um, really, really important in, uh, in, in, in stopping the bans from going forward. And that actually, I, I think a bunch of states just filed a new amicus in the, in the Hawaii case that really kind of underlines um, both universities and more broadly, like what the state interests are. And then, then, then I think so people understand a little bit more the roles. Sure. So we've got the ACLU litigating this case with, with, a, with a number of allies around the country. And then we had like states bringing their own distinct lawsuits. Can mm -hmm. you just talk a little bit more about the role of states as entities then? Yeah, and the this is something, you know, that um, <laughs> uh, we saw, uh, you know, the state of Texas um, in the Obama administration, uh, uh, you know, states have been involved in various kinds of public interest litigation, you know, I think at an increasing rate over the last few years. And so, um, so uh, you know, when it comes to immigration, obviously the state of Texas and other states sued uh, the Obama administration and managed to, to scuttle the, uh, the DAPA program, which was supposed to be, you know, the follow-on to DACA for, for parents of, um, of, uh, of US citizens. Um, and, uh, and what we're seeing in the, in the Trump era is that states have been you know, very active in, um, in pursuing challenges to, to Trump, administra uh, tr Trump immigration policies. Um, and you know, so far to similar success. Great, thanks. Um, I don't know if you want to answer these questions. These are prognostications here. Uh, uh, but, but about the, I think there's some, one question here about clarification on the, on the uh, third Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got non-Muslim majority countries in it. So um, how does that impact your, your constitutional law claims? Yeah. Um, and how are you going to litigate the case? Well, I think if you look at, at the, the way the ban, this third ban actually works, um, it's very interesting that the, the inclusion uh, of, so the inclusion of non-Muslim countries means that North Koreans are, are now included in the ban. Um, and the, the broad headline you will sometimes see is that Venezuela is also in the ban. But the truth is what they've done, well, North Korea is banned, but about 100 people came here from North Korea last year. So compared to the, hundred plus million people who are banned on the other side, you know, in the rest of the ban is really, you know, not even a rounding error. Um, and Venezuela, interestingly, even though according to the government, Venezuela met the criteria that would cause a country to be banned, they decided actually not to ban almost any Venezuelans. The only Venezuelans they're banning are people who are associated with certain gov government ministries in Venezuela that have you know responsibilities that have to do with like passport betting and stuff like that. So I think if you actually dig a little bit deeper, the way that they've included these non-Muslim countries actually reinforces the fact that they are designing this um, to be a Muslim man. Yeah. Chad, Chad, majority Muslim. Yep. yep. And what about? Um, what do you think is going to happen in the Supreme Court? That's, that's a question. <laughs> it's here. So 
I'll ask it, and, and you can. Well, you know, we may, I mean, I, you know, I've, I, the number of cases that I've been involved with that people are like, oh, this case is definitely going to the Supreme Court yeah, yeah. versus the ones that actually do is, you know, you never know for sure what's going to happen, especially in this case where there have been so many twists and turns and there may well be more. So I'm not even going to say that we're going to be in the Supreme Court, much less say what, what they're going to do. Um, but, you know, um, right. yeah. And that sounds like a, not a dodge, that sounds like a fair and honest. No, no, I, I, I think that's I, right. I, um, but, but related to that, I mean, in terms of twists and turns, uh, when you were describing the litigation over the course of the, of the last year, including the second ban and, and what happened over the summer, um, if I recall, did the Supreme Court add an additional question about mootness to the, to the, um, to the case as, when it was granting the stay? Um, and what did that forecast to you about its interest, or at least the composition of the court, and its interest in actually reaching the merits of the case? Well, you know, we had actually suggested that the case was moot um, because of, it, it, actually under, under our reading of the second ban order, by the time the case got to the Supreme Court, we actually thought the ban period had expired. And so that they could not, even though it had been enjoined, they could no longer apply any kind of a ban. And the government apparently either agreed or was nervous enough that we were right that they changed it at the, like literally days before the Supreme Court decided whether to take the case to try to get rid of that mootness issue. So it wasn't surprising that they wanted kind of more information on that. Yep. Um, and I've got a couple questions here, more fundamentally. Can, can people who are non-citizens argue that they are entitled to freedom of religion um, as much or to the same extent as U.S. citizens? And a similar question along the same lines. Um, you know, what is the basis for seeking uh, or claiming uh, equal protection or due process of, of yeah. law if you're not a citizen of the United States? But you Right. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the First Amendment, I think, protects every, certainly everybody in the United States. Um, uh, and just so that folks understand this aspect of the case, the plaintiffs in our challenges to the Muslim ban are actually people in the United States who are seeking uh, to have, you know, who have like asked for their relatives to be able to come visit them, who've uh, filed petitions on behalf of their relatives or who otherwise have relatives overseas who they have close relationships with or, or academic collaborators or business partners or whoever. So folks in the United States who are directly affected by this ban and whose rights as you know, Muslims typically um, are affected by the fact that the president has condemned their religion. And so, so it's those people's rights that these cases kind of focus on um, and, and bring before the courts. Thanks. Um, And there's sort of a span of, of, of potential litigation um, beyond the travel ban. We'll take questions on the travel ban. We'll take any other questions people have. Please pass them down. But um, that you started with, uh, with Rosemaria um, was not surprising. It's been on my mind um, all weekend. Um, some students, current clinical students, um, and uh, some my undergrad interns from the summer who've, who've stuck around um, have been doing some work in rural communities, uh, meeting with families, helping them understand their rights in the, in the event of ICE contact and, um, and preparing plans, including possible cancellation of removal claims, which, which is a form of relief that, that's available to some folks um, on a humanitarian basis to, to, to avoid being removed. And, you know, we've um, been pretty searing experiences, I gotta say, going into to, to homes um, that seem like just normal homes. But um, you know, there's one family we met with where there was a child with cerebral palsy and, uh, and it's, that's really stuck with me. Um, so I, I guess what I'd like to ask you about is the travel ban has been principally about the rights of individuals and their connections to, 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 to persons coming from outside the United States. But then there seems to be, and broadcast by the government, 
and Trump administration, an intention uh, to enhance enforcement in the interior um, in terms of detention, potential larger numbers of removal um, of undocumented people. And you know, in terms of public education, uh, we know, a lot of people in the general pub public don't know, um, that, that most of these individuals are not individuals, they're parts of families, families that are more often than not of mixed immigration status, very often with US citizen children. The child I was talking about was a US, child, a US citizen child. Um, not that that affects whether they have constitutional rights or not. Um, but what do you see as the, as, as the next wave of litigation on that front for people inside our country? Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> yeah, I think there's a few different waves. Uh, one, one is, I think, um, you know, uh, that the the administration is is pushing very hard on states and local uh, state and local actors to kind of do their work for them, um, and there's been amazing progress made around the country by advocates in educating um, their local and state uh, governments that they shouldn't be in the business of immigration enforcement. And so there's, there's right now a, a wave of cases where the federal government is trying to put pressure on, um, on states and locals to kind of do its bidding. Um, and, and to their credit, cities and states are pushing back. And so, so that's one important thing because I think as a practical matter, you know, um, it's it's doubly terrifying to live under the threat of deep, of deportation when it's any police officer that you encounter that could that could put you in that position. You know, even leaving aside how terrifying it is, knowing that it's any encounter with a federal immigration official. Um, so that's that's I think an important part of it. Um, I think there's a ton of work uh, that, you know, is being done in, in various ways and continue, you know, and we'll have to get more work that'll have to be done around the ways that enforcement is happening. Um, so, you know, uh, Fourth Amendment violations, um, motions to suppress, all that sort of stuff. It's been important for a long time. I think it's gonna be even more important now. Um, and, you know, um, like just, you know, continuing to um, to try to find ways to put limits on um, on on the kinds of um, enforcement tactics that the that the feds are using. Um, you know, it's uh, yeah. There, I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks. Um, here's one that I had in mind. Um, how does the travel ban compare or relate to the internment of people of Japanese descent during World War II? I've gone to two undergraduate uh, schools in the last year and used Korematsu as the sort of basis for talking about the Muslim ban. Yeah. So maybe you could. I mean, it's an, it's an important frame, right? I mean, it's this, the same basic argument from the government, which is that, uh, you know, we believe that this group of people is uh, broadly dangerous. Um, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I look back at Korematsu, and in Korematsu, the government was actually making a stronger claim as to danger, right? Um, uh, in, in the travel ban cases, it's kind of like, well, there's a group of people we're kind of unsure about, and we're going to use these national security things as, as reasons to say that the court can't even look, um, look behind or look at the reasons we're giving for why we have to do this thing that's blatantly discriminatory. Um, and that, you know, that... That uh, analogy, I think, hasn't been lost on the courts. Um, it just in the argument we had in the Maryland District Court a few weeks ago, um, the district judge asked, you know, basically said, to what degree can I rely on what the, f what the government is telling me about what's in this report that you did uh, but that you say justifies the third uh, travel ban? you know, against the backdrop of essentially knowing that previously the courts have relied, in Korematsu, the courts relied on the government's characterization of what the, you know, the danger was, and it turned out that the government had just lied, you know? Um, 
and and so there's that aspect of it. There's the aspect of kind of broad deference to national security invocations. And I think the lesson really is, right, the lesson that the courts have taken from Korematsu correctly is that they've got to be really careful about, um, about this, uh, this idea that just because the government says national security, I mean, even then in a time of war where there were actual, you know, uh, where, where, where there was a war on, um, that, 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 um, that the courts have to be careful about not becoming an instrument of discrimination um, and not abdi ab abdicating their role um, just because national security has been invoked. Yeah, that, there was a related question. Has the US government released information purporting to justify the countries targeted in the, in the latest one? Yeah, I mean, they, they have given a narrative um, in, in the third executive order that says, you know, various studies were, were conducted, but it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of lacunae. Uh, there's a lot of things that they don't say about what the reports concluded and about what the agencies recommended and all that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of questions, there's maybe more questions raised than answers actually given by the narrative that the, that the, that the, um, that the government has put forward in the, in the memo. And um, I think this one is one I was thinking of last time. How do you think the, the attack yesterday in New York is going to potentially impact the, the course of the litigation? I mean, you know, I live in New York. I live right near uh, where that attack happened. That's my alma mater, that high school that was right next to it. Um, and I've biked down that bike path probably thousands of times. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I think that what New Yorkers are showing is that, you know, we're not going to um, treat this as, a, as an excuse uh, to turn our back on who we are as a city or what we stand for or what our principles are. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think that, I actually think that the, the uh, uh, Americans generally are in a better place to, to kind of take that same approach um, than maybe we have been uh, in the in the past few years. And you know, certainly the the idea that you know whatever visa program this particular person had to come happened to come in on now has to be discontinued for everybody. Um, you know, it's really a, it, what it what it reflects is. The, um, the agenda, right, of, of the administration. They're going to use any excuse they can uh, to enact a platform um, that is um, nativist. So, you know, I'm sure if he had come in on a family visa, they'd say, oh, we should end family immigration. You know, wh whatever it was, it would just be an excuse to get rid of immigration to that degree. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, and like I said, I mean, I, I would take... I, I would have the country take its lead from those of us who actually live there and actually, you know, um, uh, you know, I was out on Halloween last night, tons of people in the streets, you know, living their lives. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to tie some of these questions together a little bit. Um, one's about seeking a fairer and more just immigration system, what that would be. Um, one of them's about the Obama administration, I'll get to that. But I, uh, on the fair and just um, system, when we started this program in a pilot form f over four, just a little over four years ago, um, this was in the context uh, of um, 68 senators voting for comprehensive immigration reform and, um, you know, not bad odds on, 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 on passage if it could if we could get past the uh, House leadership, um, which it didn't, of course. Um, but our vision of, of a litigation project, a program um, was one that would, against a backdrop of constitutional legal norms, basic respect for the dignity of, of, of non-citizens, mm -hmm. um, immigrants and refugees, uh, carried forward progress made over many years 
again, in an institutional system that, that, that was supposedly functional. Right. Um, and then what's happened in the interim, which is where I think the Obama administration question comes in, which goes to, wasn't the Obama administration in some part laying the groundwork for um, what we're seeing now in its treatment of, of um, Central American women and children who were detained uh, in remote locations in the desert. Uh, we saw John and, and other students in the audience here were, were part of you know, trips that many other law schools made down to, to Dili, um, Federal Detention Center and other places to, to represent those folks. Um, but that, A, let's, I'll, I'll start with that. Did that lay uh, groundwork for, for the current administration's actions? I mean, certainly the, you know, the, the, a lot, um, a, a lot of, a lot of the, yes, I mean, the, a lot of the things, a lot of the uh, kind of policies that the, some of the policies that the Obama administration, you know, put into place were just straight, uh, were deeply problematic. Um, you know, when it comes to how they treated um, uh, migrants from Central America in particular, um, you know, family detention, uh, detention in general, their use of immigration detention in general. Um, and those policies have, you know, largely been picked up and, you know, maybe expanded at the margins by the Trump administration, but that, you know, they, they definitely pioneered a lot of stuff uh, or, or, you know, uh, a lot of the things they did, um, uh, you know, were, were kind of picked up by the, by the subsequent administration. That's why I said, like, I don't think, you know, the goal can't be to return to where things were, um, you know, uh, in the spring of 2016. Like, they, and, and they can't really be to return to any particular point, right, I think, in, at le in, in our immigration history, because the truth is that, you know, administration after administration has, um, you know, in one way or another, um, you know, especially since 1996, but even before then, like, you know, enacted or undertaken extremely harsh measures against people who don't deserve to be treated that way. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And I think maybe my follow-on question to that, maybe a second part is, uh, would start with your description of of the high point of this litigation, you know, where, where um, you had that technology in that courtroom that created, you know, this amazing moment um, and actually led to a, a judge order and that same technology brought thousands of people into, into, into airports mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in a really profoundly moving way that I think was, um, you know, and I, I do agree that if those things hadn't happened, as, as, as premises for where we are now, mm -hmm. it would be way more frightening. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that same technology, it's like, that's isolated us, you know, the bowling alone, the, um, um, and, you know, in my view, that also allows for the sort of abstracted cruelty of, you know, the tweets we see, and, and, and that's just symptomatic of, uh, of a, of, a, of a lack of genuine human in interaction. Um, doesn't that underpin um, the degradation of, of, of concepts of human dignity and, I and ideas of, 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 of um, individual worth um, that, well, that are at the core of our problems right now? You know, I guess what I'd say, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit, maybe, uh, I, I actually do tend to be an optimist at heart, and I, I think that... Me too, I'm just playing one. <laughs> um, it's a pessimist right here. I, you know, I think that the, what we've seen as more and more people have um, more and more interaction with immigrants in their daily lives, you know, where immigration is just much more of a phenomenon around the country. Yeah. You know, I think if you, and, I mean, I think the truth is that, that the more, you know, Trump pushes, actually the better core support for 
immigration and immigrants gets. Um, it doesn't mean that that translates into policy, right, because of the way the government works, but I think that, um, I think that, that, that people are having that, uh, that community experience, um, that they are seeing increasingly understanding the role that immigrants play in, in building and, and maintaining strong communities. Um, and that ultimately that's, you know, going to win these fights for us. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, there's definitely a, a way that um, a lot of the most hurtful uh, and dangerous rhetoric gets, gets amplified through some of these channels. Yeah, and that goes to the technology. And I, I guess to take that, you know, maybe this is the third part of that question is, is, is um, when you're thinking about impact litigation, like I said before, we thought it was about incrementally advancing the positive uh, uh, um, advances we could make in, you know, through legislation um, and other forms of advocacy outside the courtroom. Now it feels like we're in a different place. Um, you know, if you look back in history in the civil rights movement, for example, um, very careful, concerted thinking about how impact litigation would mesh and interface with uh, non-lawyers pursuing other forms of nonviolent, morally coercive action that was in tandem that would work, mm -hmm. that would work on policymakers, work on, on, on people with power to make difference. And um, part of the diffusion of the technology it feels like that's harder to, to envision how and, and, the, and the process um, has been so, so rapid in the last year and a half mm -hmm. from where we thought we were, perhaps. Um, how, much of, how much of your work, and I know you haven't, it's hard to get your head up in some of this, but how much time do you spend or do your colleagues spend thinking about, about how your impact litigation should interface with, with advocacy and, 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 and the movements of citizens outside, yeah. of, outside I mean, of the courtroom? We think about it a lot, and, and I do think that the, you know, I think that one of the things this Muslim ban story tells us, but not just the Muslim, you know, the, if you look at, 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 at um, you know, what happened with healthcare, um, the people actually showing up makes a huge difference, and the technology is, is a big way to drive that, you know, to make that possible, to make it possible for people to know about what's going on, and and to participate, and so we've actually, you know, as an organization, invested, you know, a lot of resources in trying to help literalize, literally mobilize people, get them out on the streets, get them into meetings with their legislators, do all that stuff, um, because I think we see both that it's important and that it's possible in a way that um, that it hasn't been in the past. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think. I think that's an important kind of thing going forward, and and we definitely think about ways uh, in which you know not just like it, 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 ways that that our litigation you know and and that mobilization work can can work together. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm also an optimist. I I, I actually am. Um, I think some of my students can attest to that, um, but. To me, what I'm seeing, I mean, going back to Rosa Maria, uh, to me, what's, what's most disturbing about what's happening now is, is the harm that's actually happening now. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it will be documented fully by epidemiologists for another several years, probably. Um, but apart from sort of um, assaults on legal norms, constitutional norms, um, concepts of respect for other people. Um, in terms of concrete harms, it does feel to me like the coherent policy theme, if there is one, is fear and division and the, and the intended impacts of that on people. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have access to that information yet. Um, but I, to 
to me, it feels like impossible to overstate the actual harm that's being done to, to people, especially young children in these families around the country. I mean, millions of kids um, who are living in a state of enhanced fear. Um, that feels like a form of state violence that should be actionable to me. And um, what do you think of that? I mean, I, I, that's why I'm maybe to the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, stage left. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, action, actionable is a, a tricky word, uh, but... You guys are creative, so... Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think that certainly I, th I think it's incumbent on all of us who do this work to work in this field to highlight those things, right? And, and you know, um, to highlight them on the individual level when we talk about individual cases, right? That, that obvious, you know, so, you know, what's happening to Rosa Maria and what's happening to each of her family members, right? Including her LPR grandfather and her US citizen cousin and all that's, you know, but also, you know, to talk about how many other families there are in communities that are, that are you know, experiencing similar harms and to talk about, um, um, you know, the harm experienced by the community as a whole, which is, I think, a little bit, you know, even different. But, you know, I, I think that that's, that's work, that's, it's important for us all to kind of, to remember to do that work as we're working, you know, on the kind of day-to-day -day of whatever the particular case is. Um, you know, I, I, because, because, because I think it is, you know, it's, it's important um, both to expose it and to, you know, for people to kind of understand um, what it means. Yeah. Um, here's a sort of uh, optimistic question. It's, it's got an optimistic premise. Once the pendulum is normalized, quote unquote, somewhat in the hopefully parenthetical, not too distant future, do you foresee policy or constitutional changes to diminish the powers of the president uh, to unilaterally um, control immigration? It's an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, and certainly our view is, and I think there's lots of good argument, reasons for this, which you're welcome to read in our briefs, like certainly I don't think Congress ever thought that it was giving the president the kind of authority he's been trying to exercise, like in the ban context, uh, or maybe in a lot of other contexts. And I think that, um, so I, I, you know, you could imagine that that's something that Congress would take a look at in the course of, you know, some reform of the immigration system. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it is a little hard right now to imagine any kind of thoroughgoing and, and positive uh, reform effort happening. Um, but, you know, it was also hard to imagine Donald Trump being president two years ago. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we do actually have to keep that in our minds that there's, that there's you know, there's potential on both sides of this, of this stuff. Yeah. I think we're almost exactly on time, which is very, very rare for me, but um, <laughs> people are laughing. Yeah, um, I just want to thank you again for for being here, um, especially in the midst of, of what you're doing. Um, thanks for protecting my constitutional rights. <laughs> it's my family. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, it's me again. I can say sorry to my boss for butchering his name last room. We know what we'll be uh, talking about in my performance review this year. Uh, but uh, our next presenter is uh, Deepa Iyer, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Social Inclusion. And I'm not going to butcher Deepa's name because actually my nickname was Deepa growing up. It was a pet name that my, my uh, mother had for me, but through some leaks and disclosures, it made its way to a junior high school coach and then ended up sticking with me through junior high school, high school, and college, which I kind of liked. So. <laughs> um, she'll be presenting um, 
along with Jelani Hussein, who is the executive director of the Minnesota chapter of, Council, of the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, after they both present, they will be taking questions again, um, so please utilize the, the note cards, um, and Professor Linus Chan will be um, presenting those questions. Deepa is one of the leading voices, not just in the immigrant rights movements, but also the movements for racial justice and civil rights. Through her work, she has explored the range of challenges and obstacles that face immigrant communities in the US and analyzed not only the historic legacies of discrimination, but also modern immigration laws, particularly post 9-11 terrorism related legislation. She is an insightful and powerful author and also an inspiring community advocate and has led over 50 community conversations across the country about race. Deeper writes, and speaks poignantly about solutions to some of the United States' most pressing challenges, including in her work, We Too Sing America. Her work over the years truly transcends the current political environment we are in. And what Deepa will do is provide a national perspective of, racial, of the racial realities in the US, and Jelani will provide more local context. Minnesota is a very unique place with its rich immigrant history and its also large refugee population. Uh, its Somali res residents in particular are struggling with integration into the community and have often become flashpoints in media narratives and national politics. The tireless work of CARE and Jelani to represent their and other Muslims' interests, to champion their stories and to assert their rights in this often hostile and sometimes violent environment is an example all advocates can learn from and be inspired by. Please join me in welcoming Deepa Iyer and Jelani Hussein. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good? OK. My goal is to wake you out, uh, up out of any post lunchtime afternoon slump. So I'll do my best. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and I want to just first uh, start by congratulating the Binger Center on this amazing conversation, um, your vision, and really want to thank the staff, especially Deepinder and Kristen, who've been so helpful and welcoming um, of me. And I think that this center is very vital in this particular moment um, that we are in the United States. And I'll be talking a little bit about why um, lawyers, especially, need to be thinking about movements and movement building and movement supporting. Uh, beyond sort of the confines of the law itself. And I'm really excited that Jelani is also here um, and will be able to provide a local perspective um, because I will focus a little bit more on the bigger picture. So my goal is um, to talk a little bit with you all and then I'm looking forward to our conversation about what is the climate for new Americans right now? And also, um, what are our calls to action? Um, as Dipinder mentioned, I am an activist, so I will be providing some calls to action, um, which I hope is all right. Right. Um, so I actually wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about myself and just uh, my point of entry into the work that I do. I am an immigrant myself, a second generation immigrant who uh, was born and raised in Kerala, India. At uh, the age of 12, my wonderful parents, who are pictured here, decided to bring my brother and I to the wonderful state of Kentucky. Yes. So uh, Kerala to Kentucky was not an easy transition, as you can imagine, when you're 12. Um, but we grew to build a community there. Um, that's me with my hands on my hips, practicing my bossy skills very early in life. Um, and <laughs> grew on to, um, went on to go to college in the South um, and law school in the Midwest in, at, at the University of Notre Dame Law School. Um, and, but it was really, for me, a specific moment that propelled my um, deeper political consciousness and my racial consciousness. And for me, that was the post 9-11 moment. Um, the 9-11 moment itself, of course, is one that is etched in our history. And um, I talk in my book that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that that moment and the weeks that came afterward were really a process of double grieving for those of us who are in communities of uh, Muslim, South Asian, Arab communities in particular. And um, a, a grieving for what happened on that day, but a grieving for the fact that we meet 
immediately became scapegoats in the war on terror. Um, this is a picture that was actually taken four days after 9-11 at the Japanese American Memorial in Washington, D.C., where advocates gathered and we sent a call out to our country um, to remember the lessons of the internment, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. Sadly, we have, we have had to visit that memorial many, many times over the last 16 years to deliver that same message. But it was that moment and what was happening within South Asian Muslim and Arab communities that inspired me to use the privileges that I had, particularly in terms of being a lawyer, and uh, put that into action. And I was very humbled and fortunate to lead an organization called SALT, South Asian Americans Leading Together, the first and only progressive national South Asian organization that focuses on civil and immigrant rights issues in the US. Um, and I led that organization for 10 years at a time of tremendous crisis, crisis points for South Asian communities in particular, um, and learned about uh, what it means when local communities organize and what it means to be in solidarity practice. Um, after I left SALT, I um, realized that one of the things that I wanted to do was to really document document the stories of people who were living in post-9-11 America. So I went on to write a book called We Too Sing America um, and have been touring the country over the past year with that book. Sadly, the themes of that book have come into greater uh, profile, I should say, or prominence um, over the past uh, 10, 11 months. Um, and the themes of that book are some of the ones that, that I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I also work on a project to explore multiracial solidarity and what that means in this moment. So if you're someone who lives listens to podcasts, you can check out a monthly podcast I do on solidarity. But I wanted to start off by um, setting a little bit of context um, in terms of the racial realities that our country is facing and communities are facing. And for that, um, we have to get a little bit into the weeds with the data. So um, just a few, few number slides, and I'm a lawyer and I don't like numbers either, but really quickly. Um, so as everyone knows in this country, we are in the midst of a really fast changing demographic shift, right? Um, and what that shift looks like is that by the time we get to 2040, um, our country will be a country in which communities of color will actually um, be the majority population, right, in the American landscape. And we know this. No one community of color will be the majority, but communities of color together. Um, we also know that when you look at the census data, um, and you look at uh, what happened between 2000 to 2010, and this is already dated at some level, um, that there were tremendous changes, particularly among Asian and Latinx communities, who are the primary demographic drivers in this country. And um, that is for Asians because of immigration, migration trends, and for Latinx communities because of greater numbers of births in this country. Um, but other communities are also on the rise, where the white population, as you can see, is starting to not grow as steadily as it has, and that's the projection for the future as well. Um, the United States still tends to be a place where immigrants want to come and refugees want to come. We still receive the largest numbers of immigrants, at least so far, um, around the world. And the countries of origin where people come from, as you all know, um, here in Minnesota, um, really range. So um, obviously Mexico, Central American countries, but also Asian countries. And people who are coming from African countries, African immigrants, are surging at some level um, in terms of the numbers of immigrants here. In Minnesota, this is also the same. Um, this is a slide that I picked up from Minnesota Public Radio in 2016. And in Minnesota, as you all already know, um, people of color um, are making up 19% of the total population. And the fastest growing racial group in the state was the Asian population, followed by black and Latinx immigrants. Um, and that's between 2010 and 2015. So the demographics are shifting, right? Um, and we, are, we haven't actually seen this sort of demographic change in the United States in our country's history. But at the same time, our treatment of immigrants has always been one of a bed of nails or a welcome mat of nails, right? So while we have um, you know, really important and meaningful statements that we, that we etch in, in, in places like the Statue of Liberty and otherwise, um, we know that the way that working class immigrants are treated, the way that migrant farm workers are treated, um, the way that un unaccompanied minors are treated, and on and on and on, um, is really not with that welcome mat, but it is a bed of nails. And that bed of nails is something that we're seeing over and over when you think about the changing landscape um, as well. So with this changing racial landscape, what are we seeing and what are we likely going to see? We're going to see and are seeing backlash and violence towards immigrant communities um, and also people of color communities. 
we're seeing this sense of a scarcity model. Like, I need what's mine and I need to keep it and I'm not going to give up anything, instead of an abundance model. Um, we're seeing silos of distrust and competition. We're seeing this fear of losing the mythical America, which is really kind of the, the underpinning of make America great again, right? Um, and we're also seeing policies that restrict benefits and rights to immigrants and communities of color. This is likely what we will continue to face. And really the question for all of us is, or as a center for new Americans, as lawyers, as people who are advocates, is how do we disrupt this, right? How do we course correct is really the question that we ask ourselves. But in order to answer that question, I think it is important to look at the past a little bit to see how we got here and, and why it is that we're here at all. Um, so uh, my background, as I mentioned earlier, is with Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities in the post 9 11 environment. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of trends that we have seen increasing in the United States since 9-11 um, so that we can get a little bit of an understanding of how we got here in the first place. Um, and in particular, when you think about the national security infrastructure that has been built up since 9-11, and when you think about the anti-immigrant policies, um, there are three ways in which post-9-11 backlash has actually manifested itself. The first way is public uh, sector violence, right, where people are actually affected by hate violence or discrimination, vandalism, bullying, and the like. This is a picture of um, the brother of Balbir Singh Sodhi, who was the first man who was killed after 9-11. He was a gas station owner in Mesa, Arizona, and he was killed a few days after 9-11 in an act of violence um, by someone who said that he was doing it because of what had happened on 9-11. Unfortunately, the, these acts of hate violence did not stop in the months after 9-11. They have continued even though they don't often get national attention. Um, you might remember hearing about the three Palestinian American young people who were killed in North Carolina uh, by a neighbor just two and a half years ago. Beyond hate violence, we also see other forms of violence. So profiling, for example, at airports and on airlines is something that has been on the rise. This is a picture of a sick American actor, Waris Alawalia, who was not allowed to board a plane um, because he was seen as suspicious. Other public sector violence includes vandalism to our places of worship. Mosques, gurdwaras, which are places uh, where sick Americans go to play, pray, and temples um, are, are safe places. There are places and institutions that our parents built. Um, and unfortunately, they are more and more becoming places where uh, you see vandalism like this, and worse, you see attacks like this. I'm sure you will remember the 20, 14 um, killings of um, six people uh, in, in the, in the, at the Oak Creek Center of Wisconsin, um, which is a very, um, it's, a, it's a place that is very special to me, and so I often get a little bit uh, perplexed when I talk about it. But um, these are the six people who were killed um, at that particular Gurdwara in Wisconsin. Um, beyond hate violence, beyond vandalism, we also see high rates of bullying affecting our children. So um, the Sick Coalition talks about how turbaned sick children experience bullying at more than double the national rate. And we also see violence in schools in terms of the prison to, uh, the school to prison pipeline, right, which obviously affects black and Latinx students at very disproportionate rates. Um, but you might remember this young man, Ahmed Mohammed, who um, had brought in a homemade clock, which was seen, perceived to be a, quote, bomb, and he was taken to juvenile detention. So uh, being black and Muslim, being an immigrant and Muslim um, in this country, in the school system, <coughs> lends itself to violence like this. So beyond the public sector violence that we saw after 9-11, a second way in which the backlash manifested itself was through policy, was through government policy, state violence, so to speak. And there are so many different policies in the alphabet soup of the national security infrastructure that was built up after 9-11, so to go through all of them would take a lot of time. But some of the ones that I think are important to mention are the arbitrary detentions and deportations that we saw after 9-11, the closing of immigration courts to have secret hearings. Um, one of the policies that really escaped national attention was that of special registration. Um, how many of folks in the room have heard of that? Yes, 
That's good. A lot more because um, you all are in the legal community. Um, usually folks haven't heard of it because it really didn't get a lot of national news. It was a program implemented in 2003 and 2004 under the Bush administration where the Department of Justice um, decided that it wanted to see people who came from 16 Muslim-majority countries. If that sounds familiar, it is the antecedent to the Muslim ban, right? Um, and this particular uh, policy ended up detaining um, thousands of individuals and deporting them, um, resulting in um, small business owners having to shut down their homes on places like Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn, um, to women all of a sudden having to be um, the sole breadwinners of their families because this particular policy targeted men and boys. Another policy that we continue to see in different iterations is that of surveillance and profiling of Muslims. Um, the policy at the, uh, in, in New York City that I'm sure you've heard about, the Associated Press, broke open a story about how the NYPD had been engaging in profiling and spying of Muslim South Asian Arab communities at places as innocuous as when people were playing soccer and, um, uh, and cricket at public parks in Brooklyn and Queens, right? But but this particular policy, and it has been challenged several times in court, um, is one that we also see when we think about a policy called continuing uh, countering violent extremism, or CVE, which uh, hopefully Jaylani will talk about a little bit too, because it has actually been implemented here um, in this city, in this state, um, in, in really, really um, dramatic ways that have devastated communities. So that is kind of where we were, the, the media narrative of who is a terrorist, right, had permeated Americans, the American consciousness. Um, the state policies, the government policies around profiling and surveillance, um, which were approved and upheld by many courts and that a lot of people in the public didn't really bat an eye around. And of course, the horrific amounts, numbers of people that we have lost to hate violence, to assaults, um, and children who have been bullied, and people who have been kicked off of planes. This was really where our communities were um, when we faced the election of last year. Obviously, as we know, since then, the climate for Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities and other immigrants has gotten tremendously worse. Um, when you just look at, for example, the level of hate violence in this country, and this is a map and that the SPL, the Southern Poverty Law Center, put together um, just about two months after the election, I believe, or maybe even a month after the election, counting up to 867 post-election hate incidents um, involving all sorts of people, but also people people who are Muslims, uh, South Asians, Arabs, and immigrants. Um, you might also recall hearing about the murder of a young man, an Indian American engineer, Srinivas Kachabutla, in Kansas. Um, he was dining with a friend when um, another person there uh, asked several questions about where they were from, what kind of visa status they were on, and ended up shooting at both of them, killing um, Srinivas Kachabutla. That just happened a few months ago. Um, so the, this idea of, you know, you can't fly, you can't eat somewhere publicly, you can't walk to school and talk in your own language to your child. Um, really, every aspect of life, daily life, that many of us hold to be, that we don't even think about, right, more than once in our heads, is a decision, is a calculated decision that people in South Asian, Arab, Muslim, and other immigrant communities have to make day after day, hour after hour. Um, this, of course, has gone beyond the public sector sense because we have policies that reinforce this climate of distrust and suspicion towards these communities. And again, this is something that we've seen for some time. It is not new, except I would say that it is a lot more pernicious right now because it is part of an agenda, a nativist, a nativist agenda, a white supremacist agenda that extends from the top down. Um, so sending people back, right, whether it's Syrian refugees or banning people from coming here. Um, signs like this have unfortunately become commonplace in America's changing racial landscape, whether it's building a wall or whether it's actually uh, going to the state level to say we have to have more English-only laws or we have to have anti-Sharia laws and the like. So we're seeing this not just at the federal level but also at the state level as well. Other types of policies that our, countries, uh, our country is dealing with um, includes um, things like, and I won't go into this um, further, but obviously the Muslim ban um, that we continue to see iterations of, 
increased and heightened interior and border enforcement, where we know that the safe spaces we thought were uh, excuse me, safe or no longer safe, hospitals, courthouses, and the like. We see that this administration has ended the DACA program that um, benefited immigrant youth in this country. Um, and immigrant youth, though, are not stopping, right? They are actually pushing for a Clean Dream Act, um, which would allow them to stay in this country and avail themselves of the benefits that they should have. Um, we also see right now that the refugee program is, is in jeopardy, and that's something that will obviously affect people living right here in Minnesota, which is a home for many refugees. This administration has said that it will cap refugee admissions program at 45,000 over the coming year, which is the lowest that any White House has sought since 1980. Since 1980. Um, and lastly, temporary protected status, which is a program that is also in jeopardy in this country. The Trump administration has um, a lot of looming deadlines that are coming up where uh, protected status is going to end for pe people from countries that they cannot return to. So I believe in the next week or so, it is, we are expecting an announcement about how the administration is going to deal with some of these programs, um, particularly that in Haiti, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras. So a lot of immigrants are living with not just fear, right, around hate violence or discrimination, but are really living with a, a sense of uncertainty, not knowing what whether they can stay in this country or not um, from a day-to-day -day basis. And really the, um, the bottom line message that many of us constantly get is that it's not our country, right? That we don't belong here. And so having kind of this um, message in place, one of the things I wanted to, to say before I transition to kind of the calls to action and what do we do um, is to remind us that um, Muslim communities, Arab, South Asian communities in this country right now are often the front line of offense, which means that the government often thinks that it is absolutely going to be okay to um, put forth a policy against these communities because people won't speak up, right? But it's also important to remember that it is a slippery slope because if we don't shore up the defenses of Muslim, Arab, South Asian immigrants in particular, then it's going to be very easy to get to other immigrants. And you see this even now, today, right, when you think about the horrific attack that happened in New York City yesterday, and that this administration is now talking about getting rid of the diversity lottery visa program, which actually affects a whole host of immigrants from so many countries, right? And so really thinking about and analyzing when we see these policies come down the pike, that they're not just affecting a particular group of people they're going to actually affect many, many more if we let them happen. Um, so what do we do, right? What are some ways in which we, um, we push back? And, and one of the things that I wanted to quickly mention before I get there is that oftentimes, as I was talking about the racial landscape, people will say in return, well, the numbers mean a lot. Right? If you have more communities and more people of color um, in greater numbers in the United States and they're in positions of power, well, race is not a big deal anymore, right? But as we know, um, racial inequity doesn't go away when the demographics change. Uh, demographics, as they often say, is not our destiny. And we cannot rely on having greater numbers of people to mean that we've gotten rid of things like poverty or unemployment rates, which are really pervasive, not just in this, country, in this state when you think about um, communities of color, but also many others around the country. Um, one of the things, one of the quotes that I like to often um, read or focus in on um, is this one from Naomi Murakawa when we think about where we're going. And she says, if the problem of the 20th century was, in the words of W.E. Du Bois, the problem of the color line, the problem of the 21st century is the problem of color blindedness. Right, this, this belief that there are greater numbers and that there's greater diversity, so we're okay. And that instead, we have to actually, as she says, acknowledge the causes and consequences of enduring racial stratification in order to actually address the root causes of systemic racism and not put band-aids um, band over it. So to our big question, um, how do we create equitable, inclusive, safe communities within this landscape that we're living in that actually acknowledges these racial realities? Um, 
I think that it's really important that we actually take this moment with the same sort of um, urgency that Dr. King talked about um, in the 60s when he said that at that time, and I think we are confronted with it again, we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. That there is a thing as being too late in terms of addressing what is going on. So he says, in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. So how do we not be too late, right? And obviously, for those of you who are in this room, you're not too late because you already care about these issues and you're working on them at some level. The center is working on them at some level. Um, I, can't, I wanted to offer a couple of different suggestions um, that we might want to think about when we think of ourselves as lawyers and law students who um, are in this particular climate and who are actually trying to act with some fierce urgency. Um, the first is really to understand that the law is very limited, right, in of itself. And at many times, the law has been used to actually uh, put down communities of color. And so what are the inherent limitations of the law? Um, a second is to speak up, to shift the narrative. I cannot say uh, how important it is right now to talk about the narratives that we need to be talking about around inclusion and equity and not to be silent. Um, the third is to really center affected communities and local organizations. Um, and then lastly, practicing racial justice with a 21st century vision. And I'm going to quickly go through some of these so we have some examples of them. Um, so what does it mean to have a 21st century racial justice vision? So one of them is very clear. It's about having an analysis around race. And one of the ways I think that we can support our analysis is to think about race and racial identity as a race plus concept. And that really alludes to the concept of intersectionality that Kimberly Crenshaw um, uh, first put out and others have been adding to, um, where we understand that our identities, that we have multiple identities, right? And we don't walk in shedding one one and keeping another, that we're oftentimes discriminated against based on multiple identities. And so race is a centering concept, but it must also include other forms of identity um, that we face. Um, another important part of the analysis around how we show up is to really center and address anti-black racism in this country. That has to be the cornerstone of racial justice work. That has to be the cornerstone of solidarity practice. When we understand that, and when we center anti-black racism um, as the place where we start, then we can also include other communities of color as well. So whether it is addressing and understanding um, the ongoing epidemic of police brutality and violence that targets black people in this country, um, whether it is understanding how people in Flint, Michigan don't have access to clean water, um, making sure that we are clear about centering ra race and racial inequity in black communities is critical. Um, and lastly, um, Solidarity practice has to be a part of our racial justice work. And so what that means is that we move from being bystanders and allies to actually being upstanders and co-conspirators. That just basically means that in term, instead of having a transactional understanding of how we show up for each other, that we practice a transformative way of showing up for each other. Um, I, know, I don't know, I, I live in DC, and so I do a lot of work in the Beltway, sadly. Not anymore, I mean, I resist the Beltway. But um, uh, you know, a lot of times we're asked to sign on to statements, and you know, if you sign on to my coalition statement, I will sign on to yours, right? That is a lot of transactional coalition building, and it's important. But how do we move further? How do we actually make some changes? And I think one of the ways, um, in particular, that Asian Americans have been doing this, and this is a, this, a slide that comes from an organization um, that puts out racefiles.com, which is a great blog if you're interested in these issues, um, is that they're very clear that Asian Americans are committing model minority mutiny, which is sort of upending that idea, right, that we're often seen, Asian Americans are often seen as, quote, model minorities. And so in saying Black Lives Matter, Asian Americans are also speaking to our own communities about anti-black racism, and we're upending this idea of being a model minority. And so those are the sorts of uh, pieces of analysis that have to really underpin our racial justice work. More solidarity pictures. This is actually, this is actually a picture that I found um, the St. Cloud City Council recently, as I'm sure you know, passed a resolution proclaiming it's a welcoming community um, around uh, refugee re resettlement. And so again, how do white communities show up, right, to also uh, make sure that they're in solidarity. Um, and then the last uh, part of our race 
ethic and our race practice around racial justice and immigrant justice work is to stop seeing affected communities as clients and subjects and actually centering their leadership. Um, and that is obviously so important because people who are affected know their stories the most and they are also able to tell their stories the best. Um, so how do we keep doing that? How do we center them instead of talking for them or having them just come and speak about their story but then kind of pushing them to the sidelines, right? How do we stop engaging in those practices? And a couple of examples where I think that the leadership of um, affected communities has really shown up is actually around um, the Muslim ban. Um, we heard about the litigation around the Muslim ban, but that litigation did not occur in a vacuum. It occurred as part of a movement. And that movement, which started at airports, but actually started well before in the post 9-11 context for 16 years, Muslim and Arab and South Asian communities have been organizing against national security policies, really actually ramped up with the Muslim ban. So just about um, in the last six weeks, as we were waiting for the litigation to occur at the Supreme Court on October 10th, which did not occur, as we know, um, communities all around the nation were standing up to the Muslim ban, organizing events on the ground. Um, this is a picture from an event that happened in San Diego, for example. Um, there was um, an event that happened in Atlanta where that, that happened in a law school just like this, um, where they had um, an, an exercise called People versus the Muslim Ban, right, and actually mooted the case. Um, so there have been lots and lots of organizing and base building happening in communities around the country to build up the movement that shores up the litigation. And I think it's really important to remember that. Um, and I will um, end with with this, which hopefully Jelani can talk about a little bit too, but when we think about base building and organizing, right, the importance of centering, especially young people in this, is so important. So this is a group here, um, which actually is organized by Somali youth, right here in Minneapolis, where they actually hold forums around the program that I had mentioned earlier, Countering Violent Extremism, and talk about how this is a program that actually affects um, young Muslims in devastating ways. Um, it's called the Young Muslim Collective, um, which, is an, which is, I think, a, a, a wonderful group here in the local area um, that has been lifting up this work here, but also nationally. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that as we think about the changing racial landscape and these new realities that really are um, confronting us, right, very hopeless realities sometimes that are confronting us, I get inspired by the resilience and the constant showing up of our communities, of communities of color, of immigrants, of Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians who have a history of this, of our black brothers and sisters, our indigenous brothers and sisters who can remind us what it used to be like and still continues to be. Um, and those are the stories I think that we can get inspired by and center ourselves in um, so that we realize that there is a way through this. Right? There is a way through this, but we have to be actually extremely clear about our analysis, about how we show up for each other, and about whom we center, so that at the end of the day, um, we are indeed really clear about loving each other and creating safe and inclusive communities. So with that, I'm going to stop, um, and I want to thank you for listening. I'm excited to be in conversation. This is my information if you're interested in that. Um, and I want to bring, actually, Jaylani Hussein, who's going to talk about um, some of the ways in which these racial realities are really contextualized right here um, in Minneapolis and in the state of Minnesota. So he's the executive di director of CARE um, here. So please give him a warm welcome, and then we'll be in conversation. So I wanted to just kind of pick off from where uh, Deepa left, and I think you've covered a lot of the ground um, of the work that, that is so important now, and it's particularly this conversation uh, around what is happening. Uh, it seems like there's a sense of uh, a rude awakening that happened some not too long ago in November, uh, where all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, what, what is going on? What, what is happening? And for some of us who've been working, uh, particularly with communities of color, have been on the ground challenging Islamophobia, understanding what's happening in this country, uh, we had an idea. And actually, interesting enough, I had a friend of mine who uh, calculated to the T how the Trump administration was going to win. And I was obviously having lunch with him, just like many of you in the room. I was just like, whatever. Um, so, um, but. 
since the election, it almost feels like uh, what was already existing is now become more central, more, uh, more acceptable. Uh, but Islamophobia, uh, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, uh, existed for a long period of time. And it definitely manifests on both sides of the political spectrum. So if you think you're a progressive left, trust me, there's a lot of anti-Muslim statements that come from Bill Maher's guest and him himself, as well as also the extreme right. And for, for the first time, actually, we saw something that happened that has not happened typically for a long period of time. Uh, we've had uh, the extreme right group groups that typically would be speaking about Muslims and speaking about immigrants uh, actually converge with those on the opposite side who typically do not share the same stage. So for example, last year Ayan Hirsi Ali, well-known Islamophobe, uh, shared a stage with Bridget Gabriel, who's on the other side of the spectrum. These two women typically would not share a stage, one on MSNBC, one on Fox News, both seen as a way of reforming or re understanding Islam to a certain extent. So I wanted to kind of say that Minnesota, uniquely of all of the states that, that we have, uh, we have a very visible uh, Muslim population. And uh, since the Obama administration and even now, uh, this community comes under attack, both by this administration, but also the past administration with countering violence extremes, as you mentioned, and other things. Uh, and so one of the things that I want to just kind of maybe allude to in this conversation today, I'm going to fly through a bunch of slides, but hopefully just these are more of like ahas, ahas, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I wanted to just say that uh, we have to really look at this problem from not a perspective of they're doing it, but what is happening and who's all involved. Because it seems like there's been a movement and uh, we welcome it since the election and many people are excited, they want to help, but there seems to be, you walk into the room and people think they're doing it, so we're going to go stop them from doing it, right? That they're pushing, they're saying these things, and we're just going to tell them not to do it anymore. The reality is the conversation and the narratives are coming from both sides. And we have to be able to, to have that. Because I've had very difficult and hard conversations with people who I considered allies during the Obama administration about the Countering Violence Extremism Program when I told them, you know, how would you, say, how, how would you go by and go to uh, the community that Dylan Roof came from and tell them, hey, why don't we create a sock or t-ball program or a softball program or football program and we're just going to call it the football program that's going to help your kids not become Dylan Roof. Most parents would probably say, no, I want nothing to do with Dylan Roof. I do want a football program for my kids. Uh, but in Minneapolis, I had to push back on, on people who were saying, but it's a good idea. We're going to help your kids because we think they're all potential suspects. Uh, and, and, uh, and, as, and as hard as that may seem in this room, that's exactly the conversations we were having. Um, so all of you know about CARE. We are a national organization, grassroots. Our office was started in 2007. Actually, we're celebrating our 10th year this year here in CARE, Minnesota. Uh, and we have about 35 chapters across, across the United States. And so we leverage from all these offices, the l lessons learned, all the legal work that we have. And we have been uh, really uh, overwhelmed. Uh, but at the same time, very f glad to have that we have these networks, uh, organizations available. We do obviously justice, so we have a lot of uh, legal work. And if any of you here in this room are pro bono lawyer like, or you like to do pro bono work, please, please reach out to us. There's a lot of work uh, that that we're dealing with uh, at this moment. But mainly is education. We've been really out there to educate people. Last year alone, we educated close to 7,000 people in some form of training or presentation. 90% of those presentation and training came unsolicited. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of need for, for conversation and dialogue. And the idea of Islamophobia as it's presented today with a lot of the narratives, this idea that it's only to, uh, to, to respond to the ill understanding of Islam. No, that's one part of it. But it's really, it's a racialized, uh, new racialized uh, type of an attack. So as you mentioned, uh, Deepa mentioned earlier, the number one targets for Islamophobia are not even Muslims. The Sikh community are more likely going to get attacked before a Muslim is. A Sikh man walking to a uh, downtown, or as some of you may have even seen, there was a, a viral video of a Sikh MP in Canada where women shouting something like, you Muslims, whatever. She had no clue that this man is actually not even Muslim. Um, it's a cycle. 
that existed for a long time. It starts with ignorance and fear. Industry is created. Um, and you will go to your local Barnes and Noble, and you'll find more anti-Muslim books than Muslim form <laughs> or <laughs> accurate portrayal of Islam. Um, it's based on historical religious intolerance. So the same people, the same languages, the same type of organizing, the same type of messages are being repeated. This creeping Sharia, I always say it's the creeping Catholic arm, right? That's, that's the same thing that for somehow the Catholics were going to change the United States Constitution and little John was going to make a decision for big John and whatever. Uh, that's the same, the same thing. So, uh, and then obviously hate crimes. So w hate crimes are not happening in a vacuum. They're happening because of a cycle that we see. Uh, the media plays a big role. And so when we talk about pushing back, we can't just push back from the grassroots level of individual conversations. We have to really push back with the institutions that have historically created the environment and the perspective that many people have. Why do people think that Muslims have, tur have to wear turbans? Because that's what Hollywood did to us, <laughs> right? Um, and then local newspapers who constantly are willing to put on the newspaper the unfortunate tragedies that are happening in the world and identifying individuals based on their religion but then will not be able to do the same for other stories. There isn't a balance. When the New York, this was a study done in the New York Times, found out that the New York Times over a 25 year period had a negative uh, story about Muslims at 60% compared to other topics that are typically at 30%. So if you watch the New York Times or you read the New York Times uh, for a period of 25 years and you're a good person, you still got a bad dose of Muslims are bad, Muslims are this and Muslims are that. Uh, when the Muslim ban was ushered, most of the people who voted during the primary agreed with that. So he, Trump's administration was not saying anything that wasn't uh, said. Um, as I mentioned, the books, and it's a reflective of our casework. When we see our casework today, it's reflective of exactly what's happened to other groups, uh, particularly uh, with uh, Catholics and other faith traditions, Jews and others. So this idea of employment discrimination, that's what we work on right now. We have many companies in Minnesota that are not willing to even know. There was a company in Minnesota today that has 2,000 Somalis and didn't know Eid was coming, so a thousand of them called in for no, <laughs> called in sick. And they had no clue what was happening. I mean, that's the unfortunate reality, that that, that, that amount of ignorance leads to <laughs> uh, paralysis to a certain extent. Uh, the numbers on hate crimes across the nation and here in Minnesota have been unprecedented. We have the first ever bombing of a mosque in the history of the United States. The verdict is still out of what happened, and, but we all know that. Uh, we had, uh, um, and I'm just gonna flip through, we had uh, a number of incidents that have happened, particularly in schools. Uh, but everyone got into it, even business people. Some of you remember the Longsdale sign guy, right? He, he thought, he put down the little sign saying, Muslims get out on his little moniker at his restaurant in Lonsdale, Minnesota. And immediately attention came, people wanted, you know, and he, he actually had a lot of business too. A lot of people drove down to, to buy his ice cream. And interesting enough, him and I, we had a conversation with him. I brought a local reverend and, 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 a, and, a, and a local imam there, and we wanted to just have a conversation, find out what he's, and he was actually pretty cordial. We had a conversation, and then all of a sudden he started to get an audience, and then there was a line starting to build up. And then he just started to yell out, 911, what about 911? And then you could just tell that he was trying to raise his voice. And then actually there was a few cameramen that we asked not to come in. And they ran in there thinking that we were you know, boxing or dueling. Um, there's a man now who's facing 39 years uh, prison time because he shot at five young Somali men, literally a couple of blocks from here. And that incident actually got absolutely no, no news coverage. We literally had to continually bring it up and constantly beg for some coverage on this story. These young men were terrified to the point they would not go on air. And this incident just recently closed. They are now willing to talk about what happened to them. But one of the things that they shared to me is when they went to the hospital and one of them is bleeding and they're talking to the police officer, the police officer kept saying, I'm not gonna find a gun, am I? Can you tell me the story again? That the victims are constantly being are unfortunately treated in, in, in that manner. This is right here in Minnesota. The biggest thing we've noticed here in Minnesota that is kind of untold because it's hard to keep up this data is the, is the bullying. Now we know from statistics that actually families are reporting 
uh, uh, an increase in bullying. We also know from a recent report that bullying also involves a teacher, and we see that, uh, that a teacher would actually put a student in a perspective and say, can you tell us a little bit about ISIS? You know, to the classroom. And that's exactly, sometimes they, I mean, there's a little bit of a uh, thinking gap that's happening with the teacher, but they might actually think that they're doing something good by putting a student in a perspective where they have to respond to that. In St. Cloud, and this is before the, um, uh, the election, uh, students there have been challenging the district and challenging the community to create a more inclusive community, and particularly inclusive student uh, uh, groups. And so what, what, what we're noticing is obviously social media bullying that leads to that type. So um, actually, during and before the election and in, even more recently, what we've noticed is this type of Snapchat where someone would take a picture of a, a young Muslim woman particularly and then say something about terrorism. And one of the things that we were really concerned about was the, the, the nature of the language that was being presented in the countering violence extremism was actually fueling bullying in the schools. Students were not, were connecting uh, this case that had, was in Minnesota where all these young men, most of you have heard about that case. It had so much Islamophobic aspects to it entirely. There are two things that many people have not heard. There was a local NPR reporter who's Somali who went to the court as a reporter and the security officers there sitting told them he needed to get into the line because he's, 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 he looks like one of those people who's going up to the, to the, the thing. It was, it was reported. There's nothing really a follow-up. Uh, and then the, the Judge Davis, which all you know, went off of his way to just blanketly throw the guilt on the community. Um, sadly to say, no one has ever talked about the comparison between the case of those young men who have been recently challenged, who were recently facing time, and what happened in Colorado. Three young Arab girls wanted to join ISIS, left the United States, went to Europe in Germany, one flight away from going to Turkey and into, into uh, uh, unfortunately, into uh, Syria. But what was their crime? What did they face? What was the actual case law there? Nothing. The prosecutor there, the state, the federal prosecutor there decided not to charge them. So, we have here a case where you have a prosecutor who really, really wanted to go beyond uh, what he was doing and use this case to bring up this fear, show the young African male, and more than likely the jail will follow. We had major incidents in schools. Schools weren't responding to incidents immediately. Uh, they took their sweet time until we got involved, until we made something public, and then they were willing to act. Uh, there was a third grader who had a sixth grader bring a gun and uh, an air pistol tried to shoot him. Um, so it was a pretty, it's still somewhat is a scary time uh, right now, but right here in Minnesota, we have had our share. I wanna just uh, say that right now, most of the things that we're seeing that is kind of under the radar is the organizing. So in central Minnesota, particularly in Little Falls, in Brainerd, in, in St. Cloud, there is a group of people who are well-connected, who do organizing on a daily basis, who have been bringing anti-Muslim speakers who come and have 200 people, 300 people in the room and rile up people, tell them that they're gonna come after you. I've had conversations with people in Brainerd who say they don't go to the Mall of America because at any moment something will happen there. This fear has now been engulfed because of this organizing that many people are not previewed to. And this is what we're trying to push back a little bit by raising community members to speak to their own community to, uh, about what's happening, but also to really push back on, on, on this care, uh, fear politics. Um, so in Minnesota, I would say um, we have our lion's share of, 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 of uh, unfortunate uh, uh, incidents and, and, and rise, but also at the same time, we're starting to see the positive as well, aspect of it. We're seeing people respond, we're seeing people, you know, right now we have over 300 volunteers that have signed up to care. We're working on trying to get them to be active and actually do some of the work. Uh, so I want to end with this. Uh, if you go to our Islamophobia.org, we have a number of reports that pre provide kind of a uh, level of understanding. Who are the hate groups? What are they doing? What are they up to? Um, and the latest report, they're obviously well-funded uh, uh, groups. Um, what is their strategy? Their biggest strategy is to frame American Muslims as threat and danger to America, uh, associating individuals who commit crimes. 
uh, to, to the entire broader community. Uh, and so again, um, this is unfortunately what's, what we're dealing with, uh, legislation fear, some of you heard the policies, just was it last week? I'm, my days are now getting confused. But last week we had St. Cloud uh, um, City Council member who tried to uh, get a moratorium to stop refugees from coming. Obviously, they 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 didn't have that. So I'll up there. Um, I'll just say if you're here in the Twin Cities and you want to get involved, please reach out to us. Sign our form. Get to know what's happening. You'll never know when you're needed. You never know when you can make an impact. Uh, I think it's. It's the right time to get involved. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much um, for somewhat uh, horrifying, but at the same time inspiring talk. Um, so uh, I have a couple questions. And then, of course, we invite people. If you have a question, please write them down, and they'll be passed down. And I will judge the worthiness of the question. <laughs> Uh, but we'll, we'll see what we can do to get your answer, uh, questions answered. Um, so I have a couple questions relating to your talk and Jelani to you as well. And that is this. We kind of hear a little bit now that the immigrant rights movement is sort of mirroring the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement that we've heard all about in our schools and teaching and whatnot. And I'm just curious what your reaction to that is. How much can we look to historical precedent to see ways in which we can sort of change uh, society and laws and, and what's going on? And how much are we looking to historical precedent to watch out for cautionary tales? Because we are still dealing with the scars of our nation's history that the Civil War, the civil rights movement, we have not quite gotten past. So can you just talk a little bit more about how you see the immigrant rights movement as a movement derive its um, lessons and also cautionary tales? Sure, um, I can get us started, but I know we have other speakers and experts in the room too. Um, I think that uh, certainly the immigrant rights movement and any social change movement in this country should look to the civil rights struggle and the struggle for black liberation to figure out lessons learned. I think that's very important. Um, in the immigrant rights movement, I think that you know what, what we have seen are a couple of things. Um, one is that there's no sort of one leader, right, in the immigrant rights movement as there maybe were, was in the uh, struggle for black liberation that you can look back and kind of identify three to four core folks or organizations. Um, it's a little different with the immigrant rights movement, and, and I would say even with the movement for black lives, the Muslim Arab South Asian movement, many other movements, and that's on purpose. Um, it basically is because it is really important, again, to um, ensure that local communities are base building and that there isn't a sort of national figure that is the spokesperson that captures everyone's attention. So that is actually done on purpose, um, that kind of strategy. Um, and I think that's a good lesson learned. Um, a way in which I I think that uh, folks might be mirroring some of the, the important parts of the civil rights movement um, are really around uh, being both disruptors and bridge builders. So how do we do both? And there is a way to do both. Um, and I, I particularly remember, um, for example, when we were looking at the immigration reform, quote, movement um, under President, when President Obama was president. And there was a time that you'll remember, um, undocumented immigrant youth were talking about DACA already, right? They weren't calling it that. And I will always remember this moment when President Obama was speaking in San Francisco at an Asian American community center. And he had a group of immigrants behind him. And one Korean undocumented immigrant, Ju Hong, actually interrupted President Obama and said to him, um, what about our parents? Right? What about our families? It's one thing to, um, to protect us or help us, but what about them? And I think that was a really important moment, both for the Asian American community, but also for the immigrant rights movement, because it opened up and put the pressure on the president to actually put DACA in place and DAPA, which relates to parents. Um, so I think that those, using those movement moments as opportunities to both disrupt but build and, and call for a a, a vision that is broader. Um, and then the final thing I'll quickly say is that I think the immigrant rights movement and especially undocumented communities have been very clear about this false narrative of the good versus bad immigrant. 
So not saying, you know, oh, we were families but not felons. Um, that, is a, that, is a, that is the sort of narrative that even President Obama and the Obama administration used all the time to uh, support DACA and DAPA. But that, that kind of narrative does not help or benefit us, right, in any way, because it isn't so black or white, it isn't so clear, and it also leaves so many people behind. Um, so narrative shifting, disrupting and bridging at the same time, and leadership uh, that is across the board are, I think, ways in which the movement has shaped up. I'll just add, I think that's uh, some set up a lot. I, I, I would just add that I think the, the spirit of the civil rights movement is, has touched so many uh, people historically. And there is a lot of pain and frustration in those old black and white pictures that people can, be, can see to, 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 to use as an inspiration to, uh, to get involved. Um, I would say that in the immigrant community, there's a lot of fear. And if you remember the civil rights movement, what was, what was really evident was fearlessness, courage. Uh, people came out protesting knowing that their lives may act, they may not come home. Um, the immigrant population today, the younger generation, may be as, as willing to take that risk, but for the other immigrants particularly, there seems to be more reserve. So I would say, here's where we need to get everyone involved. Uh, people who have marched in the past, people who, who, who have heard those stories where your aunt, your aunt, your uncle have told you about that. So uh, I think the civil rights is, I think Dr. King's dream is, has not concluded. Um, I don't think that um, individuals in our society today uh, feel that mission has been completed. However, the question always is, what is your role? And so um, what makes it a little bit difficult is, there has been manipulation between the communities historically for a long time. But I think now this administration is allowing for a great unity for a lot of groups to come together and to work together and to realize that we are all here to change systematic processes and policies that have historically denied the rights of people who are brown to be able to come into the United States, to live in the United States, and to be part of the United States. Um, so this is a question from the audience, and uh, it is, I think, uh, directed more towards you, Jelani, but um, please, Deepa, if you have a comment, uh, please contribute. The question is, is how can we effectively counter and reduce Islamophobia without challenging the national security state and a foreign policy which targets Islamic countries abroad? And I think this question really is, looking at what we're doing as a country on foreign policy side and saying, can we actually reduce this idea of Islamophobia if at the same time we're bombing certain countries um, when we're talking about the communities at home domestically? Absolutely. I would say the, the, the underlining question in there, the elephant in the room, is terrorism. Um, and why terrorism? And why is it happening? And what's, what is the real reason why people would actually do such a thing? Uh, and, the, and the unfortunate reality today is because of security and because of national security, we have literally uh, stifled any conversation around foreign policy discussions. Why is ISIS ISIS? Why is Syria melting down? What is our role? What is our negligence? Those are the conversations we need to have so that we don't have conflicts around the world that raise the tension, that increase uh, terrorism, and lead it back to home where now you have a, an entire community who's afraid of Muslims, who are afraid, and who, uh, and that's why Islamophobia has this irrational fear description, because people are afraid of Muslims just because of the fact that uh, they connect that individual to a horrible incident. Uh, and, and unfortunately today, if you, tell, if, if you tell the statistics that you're more likely going to be killed by a couch or uh, two lightning strikes than a terrorist attack, most people would laugh. But that's the reality. Uh, yet, most people are concerned uh, about Muslims. And if you look at in, in the global numbers, 99% uh, of the victims of global terrorism today are Muslim. 90% or more, majority of the people who are fighting terrorism are Muslim. Muslims are the greatest to lose. When there is a terrorist attack that happens anywhere in the world, it's more likely for you to go to a Muslim and say, hey, is your family okay? Just as if what happened uh, a couple Saturdays ago in Somalia where the entire community here was grieving. Everybody was looking for their loved ones uh, frantically. 
Yet it's the opposite. When something happens, the first thing that is look for the who's a Muslim and you should be afraid of them, what they look like. So how do we change the narrative? Uh, and how do we actually expose our unfortunately bad foreign policies that continue to drive wars in other countries that lead to people uprising and doing whatever they think it's necessary to, to create this, this fear. And because most people who believe in the thoughts and the patterns around Islamophobia, their messaging comes not from the domestic Muslim, but it comes from the wars that are happening there. And what does that mean to me? I'm afraid of what is happening. So, uh, Deepa, I, I had a comment uh, with you about this idea of the DACA movement, because I had a, a personal experience in which during the 2006, there was this um, movement on this idea of immigration reform, and there was this idea of the DREAM Act, which was supposed to help uh, undocumented migrant youth, and all these other bills, ag jobs, and then immigration reform, and it collapsed. And after the wake of its collapse, as an immigration lawyer, I started hearing from undocumented youth especially, who were very upset and insistent, and this happened in 2006 and then later in 2010, where they really were fed up with what the existing structure and power dynamics were, and they began to insist on their own movement and their own power. And at the same time as a lawyer, I was telling them, wait a minute, slow down. You have things to risk. If you go out and get arrested, you might end up deported. This is really something you need to be careful about. And I, I commented to you about how amazing it was to be a spectator slash lawyer during this period and seeing how this community of people against my legal judgment, but rightfully so, really powered DACA, right? DACA is a great example of something that would not have happened if people listened to their lawyers, right? <laughs> so my question to you is this, how what, I mean, I think you've been talking about this a lot, and I want to just try to use a more concrete way of thinking about it. Like, what can we do? Yeah. Like, I feel so often that I'm reduced to being a witness, mm -hmm. even as I work within the system, right? I work within a legal system that I feel is arbitrary and unjust, and at the same time, I also feel like I'm only, I'm reduced to being a witness, and I try, to spread the word as much as I can, but I'm also very cognizant of not trying to center it on me, right? It really is on the communities that are affected. Well, I mean, first of all, thanks for sharing that vulnerable example, and I don't think you're the only lawyer in the room. I know we've all been there. Um, but I think what you said last is the key, that's what I would start with. I think for, for those of us who are lawyers, um, it, who are doing work that is in service to communities who are marginalized or disadvantaged, that the first rule is do no harm, right? And doing no harm means that we actually don't center ourselves, as you said, or center our legal judgment, but we actually let communities decide what kind of path they want to take. Um, and this is this is not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one piece, right, where the lawyer likely is going to know uh, the ins and outs of immigration law, that someone, someone who is a one person seeking some sort of adjudication in the system. But when we're talking about groups of people, I think it's really important to adopt a community lawyering approach, which means that um, lawyers are in service to organizers and are guided by organizers and are informed by them and not the other way around. And there are lots of examples of that all around the country. I would, um, just one that I would mention really quickly is something called Law for Black Lives, which is a movement that is supporting the movement for black lives, but it is one that lawyers and law students are involved with, but they take their cues from black organizers in different parts of the country. Um, even with the Muslim ban um, and the litigation, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if Omar is still here, but certainly there were many organizers and advocates who uh, connected with Omar and other litigators around some of the movement building and communication strategies, right? So it's really important that um, lawyers don't, who are working with groups of people, understand that there's a movement building strategy might not always work from a legal standpoint, but it is actually really important to let it work itself out. Um, and I don't think that one is being a witness then. I think one is actually making way and creating space for others to take leadership, which is one of the most tremendous things that I think we can do, those of us who have privilege, like being lawyers. 
So this is uh, another question from the audience. And any ideas on how to correct the record uh, when anti-immigrant hate groups like FAIR come to speak in greater Minnesota and is covered by local press as a legitimate organization? And I'm gonna actually piggyback on this question a little bit and say, we are now sort of in this environment where a lot of nativist, anti-immigrant sentiment is viewed as a, I don't know, want to say legitimate, but viewed as a voice that should have a place on the stage. Given that we're in this environment where we do have a lot of these type of organizations, whether ones that are you know, that the Southern Poverty Law Center might categorize as hate groups or not, what is it that we can do? I mean, this is an age-old question, right? How much do you, in, do you involve yourself in dialogue with groups that are, in many ways, what I would call deeply um, illegitimate, but at the same time not make it seem like you're afraid to engage in dialogue with those groups? That's a really, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I would say, um, you know, we have to have a complex and more uh, different approaches to um, when it's appropriate and when it makes sense to, to push back publicly. Uh, I think pushing back privately and pushing back, uh, just pushing back on this type of rhetoric is critical. Uh, so you should always have something that you respond with. I think the media, Oftentimes, after they're, they're chasing a conflict, so they want both sides to present that conflict. And unfortunately, one side is not a conflict. Uh, one side is a, a clear hate group. And I've had those debates with media and, and journalists in, in Minnesota and North Dakota who say, oh, are you going to debate this guy or should you talk to this guy? Or, and I say, okay, would you put another person who said these hateful things about another group on air? So when you do that and you, they debate, then I'll come on and debate as well. So you're not going to do that for that group, then you shouldn't do it for, my, for, for our community. And then they, a lot of times, are, well, this is a relevant conversation, going back to the legitimization of, the, of, the, of this. Of this. Uh, the reality is, at this point right now, uh, because there's this fear, communities are also feeling somewhat um, empowered to, to uh, either push back or to join behind the scenes. Uh, so in greater Minnesota, what we have noticed, and we've been trying to work with our partners to find multiple ways of pushing back. One of the ideas that we've been uh, tampering with is actually to go to the neighborhood where that event is happening and door knock to everybody who lives and say, do you know what's happening in your neighborhood? Do you know? And then they can actually start to resist from a local actual neighbor. That happened there, that affects me and my community, and I can push back against that. Yeah, the only thing I would quickly add is that, you know, the ideology that is espoused by white supremacist groups and nativist groups, there is a point at which that goes way too far, right? And when you have people marching through the streets and campuses of, you know, Charlottesville, Virginia, or places like Murfreesboro, Tennessee, um, that, that is an incitement to violence. The words are an incitement when you have these groups um, showing up in mosques around the country with guns drawn, that is an incitement to violence. And so, I mean, at least from my vantage point, we have to draw a line. And we have to say that that kind of ideology is actually not ideology that we as Americans are going to subscribe to, debate, have in our towns and on our campuses. Um, and I don't think it becomes a free speech issue, and I know this is a law school. I think it becomes more of a question of um, what is that line? You know, right when people are afraid that they can't even go to their own places of worship to pray, um, that I think those are the types of questions that we need to ask ourselves to decide where the line is. I'll just add one other point. If I just and I tell this to reporters, I say just don't cover it. Yeah. Just just don't cover it. Don't give them any platform anymore. And some reporters are well, we it's a no. By giving them that, you give them legitimacy. And now everybody who just watches or hears about it can say, well, I missed that event that they were talking about that. So I think it's partly raising, legitimizing. Uh, and also I think one of the things that we're missing right now is the actual connection to violence to these groups. So for example, in Grand Forks, North Dakota, anti-Muslim speaker comes there several times, invited by one of the actually city council members, goes on stage and tells this is a good guy and whatever, Two months later, the Muslim, the only Muslim business establishment there gets firebombed. We need 
to research that correlation. That guy's sitting in, he's charged now, he's sitting in North Dakota. One of you could interview and find out where he got his incitement. I think we need that to, to push back. Once we have that connection, people can start realizing that speech leads to that. Well, I want to follow up on this, right? Because traditionally, one of the greatest prosecutors of hate crimes is the federal government. And now that we see a Department of Justice that may not be interested in that type of civil rights enforcement, um, I think they've come out and said that they're not interested in some of this type of civil rights enforcement. What is the next, what is the tools here? Like, now that we're, if we're losing a, a law enforcement agency that's going to do this type of enforcement, where do we turn to to make sure these communities face, feel safer in, 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 in wake of that? I can start. Um, so I'm actually an alumnus of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. Uh, so it makes me very sad to see what, what is happening there. Um, so I think that the federal government, the civil rights agencies are not going to protect us. That is increasingly clear. So what do we do is the question. Um, I think one is we really need to look at state laws and state agencies, um, attorney general's offices, and the types of anti-discrimination policies that are in place. Almost every single state in this country has some form of um, anti-intimidation, anti-bias, anti-hate crimes law, right? And so um, I think looking at how those are structured, whether they're strong enough, whether they need to be stronger, and how they're being implemented is actually one of the first steps that we should take. Um, a second piece along those lines is more affirmative resolutions and policies at the state level. Um, so for example, um, not just resolutions that are symbolic, right, that say that we appreciate and welcome everyone, those are really important. But we need to have some teeth to some of the policies that have been uh, being put in place. So whether it is a, we welcome people and we're a sanctuary city, and this is what it means, i.e. we will not collaborate with ICE. Right? We need to see those types of, we need to see leadership from state and local elected leaders in terms of um, actually legislating in that manner so that people have a certain set of rights that they can look for, um, at least in the places that they live. So I think really devolving some of this enforcement work um, down to the state and city level is important. And I think that folks need to continue to report um, any sort of violence or assault or crime or discrimination so that we can create a record. Um, because part of what groups like CARE and SALT and many others do is to create that record um, so that people cannot say, oh, it's not true. Um, and so really encouraging our own communities to come out um, and, and actually make those reports to us, to our, to our groups, so that we can document them and put out the reports that we need to. Absolutely. I, I, the only thing I would just add is we also need the private uh, firms to take some initiatives on some of these work. Um, I'll give you an example. We, uh, there have been two cemeteries that the Muslims have been trying to build in the last two years. Both of them were, were denied by the uh, county and a township. Both of them needed a legal action. And, and actually the first time it was hard to get even a pro bono co-counseling group to work with us. Uh, on the second um, uh, case, because obviously it happened right after the election and in a little bit we got all these organizations that got involved and the, the county uh, attorney said, uh, we're not gonna represent the county anymore and it, or something in that light that was able to twist the county to make a, a swift decision. So if we can get some of the bigger firms to make a commitment to some of these cases, I think we can definitely, because just having one of the largest or le largest law firms in the state involved in these kind of cases earlier on, even if they're not gonna take it on full, but at least be part, we say we're involved, we're interested, that puts a tremendous pressure on the county, on the city, and whoever is involved, the actors, as a way. Um, and some of these cases, uh, um, historically, the government has, uh, you know, we've worked with a lot of the government uh, uh, offices, or federal or state, they're overwhelmed. They, they don't have the resources. They pick and choose few. Uh, so we need other entities to play that role. So I'm gonna, this question is inspired by the audience, but I'm gonna actually massage it quite a bit. And my question is this, um, often when incidents of terrorism happen, and they may involve residents or, you, uh, or people who are in the United States, just for instance, in New York City, um, we often hear the question being posed to your communities and your communities, which is, 
what are you going to do? How is it, and the, and the question is, what is your responsibility and your burden to make sure that people in your community don't hurt people in our community? And I, I just want to like ask you like how many ways, right? I know uh, that, that there is a lot of conversation in which there's a lot of ways in which CARE and other organizations such as yours will speak out about these incidents of terror and will talk about and how many Muslims have come out, regular Muslims, I believe there's one who was like just a YouTube channel, just a regular Muslim on TV basically going, hey man, I'm against terrorism. <laughs> And trying to make it clear of that. So how do you combat that, though? How do you deal with this constant weight of responsibility that is placed on your community um, when these incidents happen? Um, this is one of our, obviously, one of our bigger challenges. And uh, we have our own internal uh, disagreement with uh, should we condemn or not. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that most people don't know, but 30% of the Muslim population in the United States are actually African Americans, indigenous African Americans. And of all of the African Americans that I've talked to, they say, we're not going to condemn anything. We're not going to say anything. We're not going to condemn anything. And the immigrant population are more like, no, no, let's just tell them. Let's tell them what's going on. We're not. We're not. Right? We spend the entire time saying what we're not, but what we're for, or what we're... Um, and then you still get that questioning. Now, one of the things that I would say is that uh, um, what is the community doing historically? Uh, the community is just like everybody else. You know, when something like this happens, the first thing is look around. Who's, is everybody okay? Is everybody... Um, and, and, and particularly on the issue of violence, uh, I think people just need to understand that, in particular our community, the, the East African community, the Muslim community at large, uh, we are more nervous about someone who has a name, let alone even a Muslim or not, name doing something because we know what that means. You know, um, when the Las Vegas shooter was, uh, when that incident was just about to hit the news, most of us were hoping, <laughs> unfortunately, that that person was not, knowing that what that may mean to our community. Uh, so we can educate as much as possible. We can talk about it. But I think Americans need to start speaking on this. We need people who are not Muslim to push back on this clearly misguided view of looking at crime in today's society. And we elevate the terrorist and the, ter the terrorist organizations and the terrorists by allowing them to create the sense that they belong to everyone. That's what we're really, really doing. We're allowing for the, for the bad actor to have a home where he doesn't really have a home. And so that's the unfortunate reality. You will see countless incidents that have happened. The family's like, we don't know. We disown him. I mean, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. Um, and the fact of the matter today, as I mentioned, 358 people died in Mogadishu. Many people in these, family, in these buildings nearby are, have a cousin or someone who died. We are all in this together. But I think I would say that historically, going back to well... Um, Un, you know, Hollywood, the media, and everybody. We've, the only time you see a Muslim on TV is when they are a ticking bomb on, t on 24. When you see something. So we've created this narrative regardless of when, what is happening. On the flip side in our community, um, we're going to do whatever it takes to, to, to get that narrative across. Yeah, I, I think I would just quickly say that um, there's clearly a double standard when it comes to how the media and policymakers treat terrorists who are white versus those who are not white or are we're immigrants. We're never lone wolves. Right, we're yeah, never lone wolves. We never have any mental health issues that need to be looked at. We're never, um, you know, uh, our childhoods are never examined and no family member is interviewed at all to show the, the softer side. Um, and to say, oh, I don't know what happened, right? So, so that narrative that of, of uh, where it's, it's, it's so clear that it continues to happen, that we, it's a playbook, and all of us who've worked in these communities for 16 years know the playbook very well. It starts off like that with the media stories, and then the policymakers start to weigh in, right? And so, you know, I, um, I'm a, I tweet a lot, and I just tweeted, you know, just a few hours ago that, um, you know, 
we didn't see any policy changes or recommendations around gun violence um, after Las Vegas. And within hours of this terrorist attack yesterday in New York City, uh, you know, 45 is actually thinking of getting rid of the diversity visa program, right? So I think that, so when people say, why don't your communities condemn or what, you're, what are you going to do? I think the question back is, so what are, what are, white Americans doing about um, this type of double standard, right? When will people stand up to that so that the burden is not on our communities and our organizations um, to, uh, to, to respond all the time, but that the only way we can break this double standard is when people stand up and call it out for what it is. I'm gonna add one last thing. So if you imagine now, even, even within the law enforcement, if you start to identify every Muslim as a possible threat, how are you gonna find the actual person within that community who could be a threat? And that's exactly what the policies post September 11 did. They just blankly profiled the community and they, ha and they have missed all of the hard evidence on people who could be a potential threat. By adding more uh, uh, hay in a haystack, looking for that needle, it's just not gonna help. So even from a law enforcement viewpoint, this doesn't work. From a community point, it doesn't work either. So I'm going to ask one more dis uh, really depressing question, and then I'll try to end on a slightly less depressing question. So what we're seeing in terms of Islamophobia and nativism is not, unfortunately, confined to the United States, right? I think um, for Islamophobia, I think one of the worst examples we're seeing right now is the Rohingya ethnic cleansing that's happening in Burma. Um, and of course, with nativism, you're seeing uh, political parties in Germany have tradition, you know, far right parties in Germany and Austria and other parts of Europe really having this rise. My question to you is, are there ways to get cross and global collaborations in finding ways? I mean, really the, the commentary has been from some people that Western style liberalism, right, is under attack. Like this idea of democratic ways of thinking about ideas of free movement of immigration, of free trade along with that. All of it tied together is under attack. And the question I have is, what can we do as a global community? Is there something that we can do as a global community? Or is it something that we really need to concentrate first in the United States? So I, I think that there is a deep interest in cross na trans transnational understanding. I don't think that enough of it is being done. Um, uh, as someone who's been working in this movement um, and these communities for you know, 15, 16 years, uh, there have been probably five times in which I've engaged with um, European-based comrades. Uh, but I do think that's shifting. Um, I know that um, you know, people are being invited to each other's conferences and there are more conversations happening to learn about best practices. Why? Because similar things are happening in Europe that are happening here, as you mentioned. Um, for example, in the United Kingdom, there is a program called Prevent, which is very similar to the, continue, the Countering Violent Extremism program here in the US. In fact, um, CVE here has been patterned after Prevent and in many ways. And so there's a lot of learning that we can be doing about um, how that kind of program is being implemented and what we can do here. I also think that in the United States, we have obviously some unique challenges that um, we need to deal with ourselves, um, given kind of the, um, as I mentioned in my talk, um, given the intersectionality issues, the, di the changing racial landscape in our country, um, and the ongoing anti-black racism and nativism that continues to happen. So there are some unique challenges, but yes, I think that transnational understanding is welcome, and um, hopefully there will be more of that between our um, I, the only thing I would add is uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of the anti-Muslim and Islamophobia organizing that's happening in the United States, particularly in the last eight years of the Obama administration, were really inspired by what was happening in Europe. And that convergence actually gave them a lot of support and ideas. And so we've already brought a lot of that in here in the United States. I think I would say that what we really need is to get uh, the other uh, push back uh, on some of this and, and to create this kind of sh shared narratives 
uh, so that the more people can understand. And I think the only way to do that is, yes, we need the social activists and organizers there, but we also need the, the stories that are gonna be on our, not only on our airways, but also in, in, in movies and documentaries. We need to actually be able to share that information and recognize that there is a dark history that we came from and we're not gonna go back. Uh, because there are certain people that want to go back. A lot of the people in Europe who are pushing for exclusion and kicking out immigrants, they have led to policies in, in, in many countries, including the UK, to lead to what is happening over there. But really, it's about re the resurgence of hate, the resurgence of white supremacy across the globe. And I think when people start to realize that, and, and I think we can push it back. All right, so last question is Jelani um, from the audience. Who are you voting for in the upcoming mayoral election? <laughs> who do you endorse? And can you rank your choices? For those of you who don't know, we do have a rank, uh, voting rank choice system. So, Jelani? I'm voting for my good friend that I have soup with in Minneapolis, uh, Captain Sparrow. <laughs> No, actually, I don't live in Minneapolis. I live in Roseville. Um, I, I would say that in Minneapolis, we, we do have a, um, a very, really a lot of great candidates. And I think whoever wins, I think the outcome of this city leading the conversations on social justice and equality across the nation is very hopeful, both here in St. Paul. Um, I work for CARE, so a lot of people are going to think that, I, that CARE is promoting this person or not. So I apologize. I'm not going to share with you who I like in these races. Uh, I think most of you have a bright bulb, and you can figure out who would be a good person for, for our state. The governor's race. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, everyone. We're here at our, our last session of the day. I appreciate everyone. Uh, joining us again. Uh, my name is Depinder Mayel um, again, and uh, I have the honor of introducing our last speaker, Maggie Laredo. Um, I was first introduced to Maggie's inspiring work when our social work team at the center was looking to compile resources for immigrants facing deportation. Um, and Maggie's organization, Otros Dreams in Acción, um, which has garnered national media attention for its work to support young immigrants deported to Mexico, quickly got our attention. Maggie has a very powerful personal story, um, being forced to leave the United States shortly after graduating high school. Um, but, and her story, no doubt, has served as a, as a point of some motivation, I'm guessing, for her work at ODA. Um, but when I first met Maggie uh, earlier this year in Mexico City, I was struck not only by her story, but by the organization she has helped build and her skills as an advocate. Um, she is an organizer and a leader. Um, and as an organizer, she sees a problem. And no matter how big and convoluted, um, she has the spirit to get to the task of trying to fix it. Um, she sees the struggles of deportees. And no doubt, this is a group of people that agencies rarely even think about supporting. Um, that fall on that bad side of that good immigrant, bad immigrant dichotomy. And through her work, she systemat systemically addresses the concerns of their integration, their trauma, education, employment. We are very honored to have Maggie join us here today to teach us more about the people who are directly affected by enforcement and deportation policies. After Maggie presents, We'll be doing questions again, um, so write on those note cards and pass those questions forward. So um, with that, please join me in welcoming Maggie Laredo. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a, a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's always um, nice to come back home and, and I mean, home the U.S. Um, it's always really nice to be welcomed by snow and be reminded of home. So <laughs> that that's amazing. <laughs> and well, I'll I'll start. At, let me push play. I think is that. Uh, 
should it be? Let's play, right? I hope it moves. If not, I'll just go. Okay, so I'll start. Thank you. Um, I want to start out by defining the word citizenship. According to the dictionary, it means the status of being a citizen with its attendant duties, rights, and privileges. For me, the definition has evolved over the years. Up until I was 16, I thought I held citizenship status in the US because I sang the national anthem. I was the best in my class in US history. I was very involved in my community. I did good in school. I celebrated the 4th of July. I taught citizenship classes. It just felt like I belonged here. This was the only place I knew as home. The link between life, birth, and the nation becomes obviously naturalized in language. Borders are no longer the simple edges of a state. Borders shape our percep perception of the world, even of our own lives, our emotions, and identities. This nation-state system had already failed my family, and I did not I did not yet know it. My parents had to cross a border when I was two in order to build us a home and a future. I grew up pledging allegiance to the US flag every day at school since I was in kindergarten. I grew up cheering for the cowboys, then for the bulldogs. I grew up honoring a flag, a nation. But later on, in my sophomore year in high school, I became aware that the only place I had known as mine was really not. This meant that after I crossed the high school graduation stage, I would, sudden, I would suddenly lose every right that I thought and felt I had. As I threw up the, gap, the cap into the air, it also meant that I was throwing away a great part of my identity. After exhausting every chance of staying in the place I knew as mine, I saw myself crossing the second time a border. This first time, the first time was when I was two. And this time, 16 years later, I was going the opposite way. I was heading to Mexico, the country to where I had little connection, but where I was told I had a passport, which supposedly meant that in this place, I would have, a, I would have all these attendant duties, rights, and privileges, something I never had in all my years here. I was going to be a citizen, or so I thought. For the first time, I felt a sense of freedom as I walked down the streets because I knew I had a paper that proved that I had the right to be here, something I was never able to prove back in Georgia. But even many years after returning to my hometown alone, I could not find, I, I could not find myself in Mexico, still feeling very foreign, lacking identity documents in Mexico, lacking social skills in Mexico, not knowing the national anthem, of course, not knowing the history either, not even the language. I felt invisible, lost, something about the shadows before finding others like me. I had citizenship, but did not feel as much a part of Mexico as I did here. Since the publication of Los Otros Dreamers, the book in 2014 by Dr. Jill Anderson and Nin Solis, I came out of the shadows in Mexico. Along with me, there was a community of young people that were desperate to have a voice and tired of hiding their post-deportation and post-return trauma. Since then, we formed a collective, which in 2015 led to the founding of Otros Dreams and Acción. Oh, it's not playing. Just mm -hmm. it uh, the founding of Otros Dreams and Acción, which is an organization that is made up by us, deportees and returnees. Some call us dreamers, even though many of us do not identify by this term. My community, which has also become my family in Mexico, are now living in exile in Mexico away from their families, from their friends, from their hometowns. I'm here today, but it's not only me. There must be close to a million of us now. Abby tries to explain to his three children who are in Florida why he cannot be with them right now and take them out for trick-or-treating. Diego's son questions him when he'll take him out to fish. A 17-year-old teenager asks himself, why was she deported and was not allowed to finish her high school with her friends in Michigan? 
Lalo from Utah wishes he was by his brother and, and mom's side. Yvonne wonders if he'll ever be able to go back to Esther Place in New York and see his dad. Susana wishes she was by her daughter's side. Rosie tells me to take photos of the Chicago inter airport because it was the last place she saw eight years ago before returning to Mexico. Adriana and Omar question when they'll see their mom again. Chris tells me that I'm, very, that I'm a very lucky person because I can come and go, something he can't do. He has not seen his father in six years. Lenny talks, Lenny talks about her two siblings that chose to go back to the US, separating from the rest of the family. Valeria could not be could not be by her brother's side after he had a terrible accident. Moises, Rufino, and Victor have all thought of coming back to visit their friends. And when I see families leaning on the Tijuana-San Diego border, touching only their pinky fingers, when my hands tr trespass that, those bars of that militarized border, that is when I question more and more what citizenship really means for me. The community to which I belong those that were born in Mexico, grew up in the United States, and are now back to an unknown Mexico because of deportation, the deportation of a family member, or because they returned due to the lack of opportunities under this deportation system. Um, under this deportation system is a growing population that is becoming more and more bilingual and bicultural, although not yet granted with binational rights, which again, goes back to the nation state system we are immersed in. We are a community that gives mutual support and also collaborates with others to demand their rights in Mexico and here, in the United States as well. We are a community that wants to have a voice that can overcome borders. We put, a, we put phases to this growing population of mixed status families separated by the border. We do not blame our parents, never. Mexico expelled them in the first place with policies like NAFTA. We are the children of NAFTA, a generation that wants to use our voices to stand up against. The extreme immigration enforcement of, oh. <laughs> every time I remember, sorry. The extreme immigration inform, enforcement in the US causes fear. It, cause, it causes uncertainty and shame for many but what happens when we are deported to Mexico or have no choice but to return? Well, the fear and uncertainty becomes something very, very real. And families are painfully separated day, day in and day out. This inhumane enforcement measures in place since before Trump and codified by the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act have created a growing population of young people that were formed and educated in the US and now live in exile in Mexico. We are demanding that Mexico and the United States take responsibility for this. We demand visibility and belonging, human rights, international mobility, recognition to be de aquí y de allá, from here and from there. We demand the basic human rights to be with our families. We demand to not be detained without due process. We demand to not be kidnapped from our homes and the streets outside our homes by the federal immigration agents and summarily deported. I'm referring to basic rights that can be too easy banished because of the lack of citizenship status. Sitting there answering calls when you call about your dish service and also maybe think about it when you're calling um, for your AT&T service or your dish or whatever, that that person that's um, serving you is probably in Mexico City, in the Philippines, or another country because he was deported, but he has this whole background of English and being bicultural that he serves you. So I think there's a lot to discuss, and, and, and I'm just happy and thrilled to be here and um, excited to see if you have any questions. Thank you. Any 
Yes. Right now, um, actually, just organizing in Mexico has been a huge challenge because all of the people that get deported, or uh, right now, especially the young people that we work with, um, they're very scattered around the country. And we have identified that they're in little villages where sometimes there's not even internet or phone, and it has made it complicated. Plus the fact that we, when we go back to Mexico or, or we go through deportation, we, are, we hide it because of, as I mentioned, the, the, the whole stigma and stereotypes and criminalization in the same country. We, we tend to keep it for ourselves as sort of a protection, but also because we're not emotionally ready. We, we go through like going through a loss, like we deny it, we don't feel like we're there, we, we, we refuse to be there and we want to go back, so we keep it a secret. But I have, I'll be going to Guatemala next, um, um, in two weeks, so I really want to um, connect with people there. Um, and yeah, hopefully from other places, it'll be great. So any people um, that you know or, or that are a context that can let us link to those countries would be totally appreciated. Um, um, okay, if there's another question, I can take and read at the same time. <laughs> uh -huh. Ah, here? I think, um, well, the question is, what should immigrant rights advocates here in America be doing to lift up stories of deportees or deportation to Mexico? I think that's a great question because, um, as I said, people really don't talk about post-deportation. I, I can totally understand that in part is because of the fear that, that it could happen. Like, okay, it's like, it will like we try to deny, like it won't happen to me. And, and, and I think that's a big thing of why they don't really want to look into depth, but uh, as I said, it needs to be seen as a transnational perspective. It can't just be the U.S. I, I know and I admire and I respect all of the organization and the community building that has been happening since 2001 or, or even before. And, but I do think that since now the families are being more and more separated by a border, um, even the, the community here needs to think, well, what, what would happen if I had rights in Mexico, if, if, if I could go back and forth, if I could learn uh, uh, from my culture in Mexico, and, and the families in Mexico that have been already separated as well. It, it's been hard for us to see, I mean, I saw when DACA was approved, and I would have qualified for DACA just because I was in Mexico, that wasn't going to happen for me. And I, I, I regretted it more, I was like, I want to go back, I want to go back because that would be me. And then months ago, I saw how DACA just vanished, and, 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 I, and I was like, wow. I mean, my own brother has DACA, or had. <laughs> and it's insane to just know the influence. And I also have to say that they, it, it was a, a Band-Aid to a bigger wound, DACA, and, and that the community in some sort of level said, OK, we have DACA. So the, they slowed their pace, but really, it's, as I said, it's not our parents' fault, and, and I think there needs to be done something for all immigrants, not just um, DACA recipients. And I know they're not going to give up, but I do think that the most vulnerable are the ones that are going to be um, keep going to Mexico or, or other countries. Hmm, what impacts will deportees in Mexico have when I'm coming Mexican? Ooh, this one's good. What impact? will deportees in Mexico have on upcoming Mexican elections in 2018? That is very um, interesting. I mean, I always say that I get the best of both worlds, but I also get the worst from both worlds, which is having two presidents that have not helped at all. <laughs> um, but we have to deal with it. And, and, and right now, the, the dreamers in Mexico are like a hot topic, like, oh my god, there's deportees, wow even though we've been knocking on their door since 2005, 2008, 2012. Um, because of the media and Trump, they have now 
recognize that there are deportees and, and, and people there. So they have sort of um, started using it as a very political show and, 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 and it's terrible. I mean, there have been changes, but one of the biggest things that we accomplished, um, and I think it needs to be recognized, is in terms of revalidating um, US studies. I took five years to revalidate my high school diploma because nobody knew, no, no, I mean, the, the government or, or where I went, they were like, oh no, just go back because you need some other documents, but go back and, and you can get them. Obviously, I couldn't go back, so it made it hard and, and almost impossible. But um, civil society, other organizations, and ODA were involved for the last two, three years um, with the Senate, the Mexican Senate, with people uh, empowered to say, you know what, these changes need to happen to this legislation that you have that really is just making it really difficult for the young people that are returning to access education. And uh, on January 21st, after Trump took power, Peña Nieto went out in public and said, you know what, um, we need to make changes in terms of education. But he literally read what the civil society and organizations had been working on previous years. And one of the biggest accomplishments that people are not talking, I mean, the Mexican government has beautiful legislation in paper, but they don't implement them. So that's the bad thing. And they never, they don't, they're not talking about the GED. Um, organizations like ODA and others pushed around the GED because in Mexico you would say GED and, and still right now you say GED and they're like, what is that? And a lot of the people from our community um, have the GED and it, was, it wasn't recognized until April of this year. I mean, we still have a big challenge with just implementing and, and, and sharing and spreading the word. But um, I think it's a big accomplishment that now the GED is recognized in Mexico and I need, we, we need to spread that. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting, the, the 2018 elections in Mexico. I'm not looking forward to it, but. <laughs> um, And there's others, okay. What is college, what is college, the path to employment, like in Mexico, what studied of living can deportees expect? Yeah, I think that's also a, a, a thing that we try to do in ODA, which is share information, real information. Sometimes we just see the media and we see, oh, Peña Nieto is doing this to welcome deportees, but really there's nothing, there's no infrastructure for anything. And I think it's important to, to share that message and, and also be realistic. Like, I'm not gonna say, I mean, I, 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 after many years, I, I went to college and, and now I have mobility and for eight more years. Um, but I can, I, I mean, if you think about it, the media and many people say, okay, Maggie's story is a success because she's back, because she, I love Mexico. I study tourism, I love photography. I'm, I'm in love with Mexico, I admit it. But it wasn't easy. Like I was in exile for eight years. Um, I went through a lot. So I won't say, I, I'm not gonna tell a dreamer here in the US, hey, go back because the, the, the Mexican dream can be possible. No, because it depends on factors. It depends on where they arrive, what support they have, if any. I mean, and it's not gonna be an easy, an easy process. So I have to be realistic and say, you know what? There's corruption, there's impunity, there's everything in Mexico, but you're not alone. We are a community that is growing and growing and demanding and organizing, and we're gonna fight together for that mobility. And, and just yesterday, I mean, hearing a father tell me, you know, I don't know what I should tell my daughter because I told her I would be back in 100 days and she's already counting them, and I'm not gonna be able to be back in 100 days. And it, it just breaks my heart because I'm talking about family reunification. I'm talking about the 1996 laws. I'm talking about all this, and I'm, I'm here, like just being here is like, why am I here and not them if we're the same? You know, that's, that mobility really has been, I mean, yeah, I wanted it and, and I felt good, but it also means that I have a huge responsibility and, and a privilege that should be a right. Um, what do you propose? Uh, what do you propose? Let me separate the ones that I did. Can you talk about the Mexican government? Somos Mexicanos, wow. I wonder who answered that, who made that question? Somos Mexicanos. That's very interesting because immigration. Um, uh -huh. ah, okay, yeah. Can you talk about the Mexican government, Somos Mexicanos uh, program? 
if it is being implemented the way it is supposed to be? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Immigration in Mexico um, actually deports a lot of people, a lot of people. And it's funny how the same um, institution uh, is in charge of welcoming deported and returned Mexicans. Um, I go, like Oda, we go to the airport. Um, there's, there are three uh, planes that arrive to Mexico City, to the airport. Right at the last, at the end of the airport where the trash is, they arrive and they, so many times they have told us that they're even still handcuffed in Mexican territory. And we go and it's, it's insane. I mean, there's three people from the government that um, give them flyers and take a photo with them. And that's it, okay, I give you the flyer, I took the photo, I wrote your name down on a list, and now you're on your own. What ODA and other organizations like Deportados Unidos en la Lucha, which is another organization of deported people, do is we go, we stay there until their family gets here, we lend them our phone five or 10 times until their family can find them at the airport. Um, they're also taken to the bus station, many of them, and they're left there alone as well, being, um, I mean, they're, they're, they have been, um, an easy trap for the organized crime or for people that just want to take advantage of them. So the program Somos Mexicanos gives you a piece of paper that says, has your photo and says that you were repatriated and you take it everywhere. Supposedly this paper should work uh, as an ID. It really doesn't. You go to a bank and they don't know what that is. You go um, to any other organization um, from the government and they don't know what it is. So it really hasn't helped a lot. And there's not also um, many statistics because uh, they, the Somos Mexicanos is only a program that talks about people that went through a detention center and were deported, but there are other people, like people that return, people who sign voluntary departures, uh, complete families that come back, and those are not in those numbers, so I think that's also. But we're trying to make it, or push it, or make it visible, but as of right now, it really has not helped in anything to the community. Uh, okay. And what do you propose in place of nation state citizenship? <laughs> That's also another question that I do myself every day. But I do, um, I do believe that I, I, what I really want is to be from here and from there. In Mexico, when I speak English, people stop me and say, where were you born? I'm like, San Luis Potosí. Then why are you speaking English? Well, because that was also my language and I shouldn't hide it. Um, or, People, won't, people told me, why are you gonna vote if you haven't lived here in Mexico? Or your parents are traitors because they left Mexico and they didn't stay to suffer with everyone. Or many questions. And, 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 and that Mexico is telling me with all of that that I, need to, that I need to choose. If I'm Mexican, okay, hardcore Mexican. But also in the US, if, if, if I love the US, I, I love it because of my high school, my brother, my nephew, my niece, my friends, the places, the weather, everything. But that doesn't mean that I should also say, okay, no, I'll defend the US. I have seen people like um, Deported Veterans is an organization that has had a lot of attention. And I, I, I admire them also, but I see like, I go to Tijuana and I see all these US flags and I'm like, like why? That's my question, like why? So I don't believe in nationalism. I, I want to be from here and from there. I, I want a free mobility. I want um, to be able to be here today and tomorrow be in another country or back in Mexico to be accepted and recognized in both places. So I think instead of that, I would go more for, for mobility and, and, and to belong and, and be accepted. I'm not sure if there are any other questions besides that. We're done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Did it go over the whole thing or just?
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. That concludes the, today's uh, sessions. Thank you to our speakers once again, to Maggie, to Omar, to Deepa, to Jelani. Um, and of course, I wanted to give a special thank you to uh, Liz Cofield, who's been you know, working tirelessly on this, part of our staff. <laughs> as well to Kirsten Yeager, who's also been uh, working as part of our staff on this event tirelessly. So thank you very much.